Good evening, everyone. I'm calling to order the Board of Education meeting for August 10th at 6.03. We'll begin with roll call. Director Chancha Shore is absent and excused. Director Graziano? Here. Director Hansen? Here. Director Holtzman? Here. Director Lung? Here. Director Meek? Here. And Director Ray is here. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, next on our agenda is um, a new item that we're calling DCSD Spotlight. And this will be opportunities for us throughout the year, similar to our recognitions, but a chance for us to really intentionally put the spotlight on different areas of our school district. So with that, I'm gonna turn that over to Superintendent Wise. Good evening, sir. Good evening and uh, welcome to our first board meeting of the 21-22 school year. We wanna start with a spotlight that really just showcases uh, our beginning of the year the amount of time and work it takes to prepare and then getting into our, our first days and week back. We've been excited. Wanted to give a shout out, a thank you to our communication department putting this together uh, and all of our schools and staff and I hope you enjoy. The first day. This is the most important day of the year. Because first impressions mean a lot. <laughs> These Mountain Vista freshmen were treated like stars. So this is just the class of 2025 this morning. For those new students to come into school and feel the energy and, and that was, you know, obviously not there last year. After the past couple of school years, emotions were everywhere. Kind of nervous. Nervous and fun. Yeah. You doing okay? Yeah. Overwhelmed yet? Are you doing all right? I'm fine. It's easy. Good. We know of some of our students that, that have high anxiety about coming back. So preparing for this year has been a little different. We've had a lot of conversations about flexibility, about making sure we're meeting people, not only kids, but staff where they are. Praise the party, the party's over here! A welcome like this can be intimidating for a freshman. I was terrified, it was so scary. So the school is doing all they can, and the message is clear, there is support. We might not always know how you're feeling, but we do have plenty of professionals here to help you. And I think that's the biggest thing is just knowing you have a community at the school regardless of what happens with COVID and everything. Small groups of freshmen were paired with upper class link crew to show them the ropes. So do you guys have ceramics? Do you have ceramics? It's been good. All the older kids are nice and everything. Link crew and we have always wanted to build a culture that your upperclassmen are there to help you out. The freshmen made a quick run through of the classes on their schedule and took their pictures. Where is the party? but more importantly, took in a slice of normal. This group of freshmen, you know, basically left school on March 13th of their seventh grade year. That was the hardest three months of my life. I would say now's your time to really start over. We're looking forward, hoping for a great year. We're ready for the challenge, and that's why we're here. All right, let's give that a round of applause, that's great. And Superintendent Wise, I would just echo, I know all of us feel this way, what, what an uh, incredible experience especially for all of us that had a chance to get out there and, and visit schools too. And we also want to certainly thank Paula Hans for all that great work and our communications team, Stacy Rader, uh, for providing that. You know, I was in a third grade classroom yesterday and I knew the teacher, so I went in and I said, you know what? Do you guys know that you have the very best teacher ever? I just want you to know that you have the very best teacher ever. The little girl raises her hand and says, 
I know I have the best teacher. <laughs> and when I thought, that is so incredible that we probably need to just uh, land on that, that we have th the most incredible staff and teachers. And I know on behalf of all of us, uh, we are just so grateful for the start. And this is just a, a snapshot of, of the joyfulness that was felt throughout uh, the day. So we just want to thank your staff, our our, what, 8,400 uh, members in our uh, family at Douglas County for all the work they did to make that work. So if we could all give them all a big round of applause, please. <laughs> all right, board, next on our agenda is to accept the agenda. Is there a motion? Move to accept the agenda. Second. Motion made by Director Meek, seconded by Director Holtzman. Let's vote. Director Graziano? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Holtzman? Aye. Lung? Aye. Meek? Aye. Ray? Aye. Passes unanimously. Next on our agenda then is superintendent reports. Superintendent Wise, it's back to you. All right. First off, thank you. Uh, Again, the video leads into a lot of great work in preparation for the school year. You know, we think about the first day, uh, the excitement, the energy, the kids uh, learning about their teachers, their classmates, school as a whole. Uh, there's a lot of variables, but it takes a lot of work. And really this starts uh, in the weeks ahead. So if you go on to slide three, you know, the preparation which goes in, teachers are coming back, schools are coming back and preparing. Uh, we had a great kickoff to the school year with the Summer Summit, and really that's our opportunity to bring schools back. How do we focus on what are our priorities? How can we put that together? Uh, what work needs to be done? And, and really focuses on student learning. Uh, where are we with, with our steps of literacy? Where are we steps of building kids in, in belonging, connectedness? And I think when you look at that, Mountain Vista did a great job of explaining what a lot of our schools do. We had soft starts. Uh, if you go to slide four, we had soft starts to welcome students, so at kindergarten, uh, different grades, middle school transitions, and the ninth grade transition. And we look at all those where kids are coming together uh, to welcome and see faces, smiles, to also work with each individual. You know, it's a plan that, that there are a lot of variables and complications. And when you look at around the state, around the country, uh, there are wants of having full mass mandates to, to not mass at all and choice uh, within that and the variables. And I think working with Tri-County hand in hand uh, really has opened up that, that plan in which we have opened up Douglas County Schools. And I think that piece of getting out, we referenced uh, getting out on the first day and for us to be visible. You know, going out in partnerships and hitting each school and talking and giving a little greeting of thank you for your work. You know, I was lucky enough to give a bag of lifesavers. And really when you look at it, the work in which schools and teachers are doing together. Um, it's about each student and lives. So I just want to say a kudos uh, for our communications department, Paula Hans, uh, in organizing that to get out to all of our schools and really the time commitment because uh, really that's, that's what matters most. So yesterday uh, and, and even today getting out into the schools and, and being visible and watching what's happening. You know, we also get to get here a lot of great input and the excitement. Watching the kids, how they interact with each other I think is key. If we go on to, to slide five, you know, we talk about what's the beginning of the year and those connections. So we talked about the balanced beginnings. Balanced beginnings with kindergarten has always been there, but it's really even more intentional about how do we come in and really pay particular attention to what are our needs. How are each student? How do we set up our systems? And really get to know each other. Again, as we saw that we also looked at uh, middle schools and high schools. Some high schools split their uh, ninth grades morning and afternoon. Some split it up with different uh, smaller groups going around the school and it's a chance to not only get in and meet each other, but meet the culture of the school. Tour around, find your lockers, find your teachers, and really get that, that taste of what's going on. It also allows that personal touch to do a check-in. We're working with all of our staff to think about what are those signs? How do we check in? How do we continue to be aware? And how are we gonna progress throughout the year? You know, as we said, in our first engagement forum, trying to get more information out, trying to share accurate information. We have a solid plan. We've had that partnership with Tri-County hand in hand to work this plan. But we also know there are a lot of variables that come in and we're gonna have to be, to be willing to look at data, to be willing to advocate and we continue to partner to advocate of what's happening in our community, what does our data look like. But we don't stand alone in isolation with that. And I think that's a key piece as we look at all of these, the social emotional, 
uh, impacts the work to be uh, that started, but the work that's going to be continued with the social emotional learning and mental health and well being. How we help and have empathy of each. And as I saw kids interacting, to be quite honest, when it comes to mass, just like tonight, um, I think kids were just great to be back to school with each other. I think uh, the mass were, were a second piece uh, within that. And I just saw a lot of great energy and positivity. So right before school, if we go to slide six, another great piece of opening up uh, our schools. Uh, thanks to 2018 bond and MLO, we've had a number of capital improvements, but one of them that we really got to celebrate was the addition of the F-Pod. And really that's, in each of our high schools, we have a blueprint through construction. And it starts with one end of the building of an A-Pod to B-Pod, C, and, and ends with an addition that's always been a part of each high school. And that F-Pod allows for growth over time because most high schools have opened with either just ninth grade, seventh and ninth grade in that building, or ninth and 10th grade. But Cass of you uh, was able to, with the bond and MLO, look at designing and during a COVID year build and now open their F-Pod, which highlights state-of-the-art journalism programs. Journalism programs with the career and technical education industry certification, college credit, our advanced places in biology and biotech classes, where you see kids uh, working with, with industry, universities, and also gaining college credit. And the excitement within that area to not only do more and connect to relevancy and rigor and higher education, I think it's just a statement um, of that partnership that we want to not only acknowledge from the past and say thank you. As we talk about more capital improvements, look for the future to build uh, even more because that's what it's all about. We heard from students and sharing their excitement of their leadership within this. We saw students setting up uh, some of the technology labs uh, and, and studios, and I think that uh, it's a testament to their uh, to their knowledge, ownership, and working forward. If we go into slide eight, we get into other. With the, the 2018 bond and capital needs, uh, district-wide, we've had security improvements. 23 of our schools have had capital improvement projects, which include mechanical, electrical components and systems, fire alarm systems, roof replacements, and other needs. Our high schools, Mountain Vista, Rock Canyon, along with elementaries, Flagstone, Timber Trail, uh, all had roof replacements. So we've worked through a number of major uh, needs and tier one replacements. Nine of our high schools, all nine, we improved our career and technical education programs. So you see cosmetology along with a number of other programs uh, which are established and built and, and put forward for our students, uh, which isn't only about now, it's about their future. Again, they're getting certification, industry certification, work experience to go into a career and also college credit at times. Mountain Vista and Legends tracks were resurfaced. Legend High School's tennis courts were replaced uh, with concrete. Cassidy tennis courts were also replaced with concrete and added to courts. Uh, Stone Canyon Outdoor ed ed Adventures, uh, we improved with kitchen and seating expansion and other needs. Uh, Larksburg Elementary School, uh, we worked on drainage and other type of capital improvements as we moved forward. And you know, another great celebration. Last year, if we go to slide 10, last year with our free and reduced, or with our free lunch and food services, we served over 4.2 million meals, all of which were free. This year, that's continuing. For all schools in Douglas County uh, School District, um, we have extended the meals at no cost through June 30th, 2022. That's a breakfast we're offered, one lunch per day. Uh, and each student will continue to provide at no cost, and that's each and every. Now, when we look at those, we also want to encourage our families to complete the meal benefits application online. So not only is it within this, but we also want you to go online and work to, to do that because that sort of support that we can provide now and, and ongoing is gonna be important. As we go into this school year, there, I also want to, to acknowledge a few things and also try to recruit. If you go to slide 10, we've opened up and we've been able to hire great people. As we said at our summer summit, uh, 484 new teachers. But along with those new teachers, we also have other positions we're still working to hire. While I've hired some, there's still a need. So I'm saying this not only as information, but also in a hope, as we've said in the past, to see if people uh, will apply themselves or recruit others. But we need both CDL and a new position, non-CDL drivers. CDL is for our large buses. That's a commercial operating license. So it takes some time and special, special, special um, education and training. Now, I'll be honest, I, I've said to the drivers, I would be intimidated to drive that large bus. Even with the CDL training in hours, the work that they do um, with kids on the bus, 
It's a specialty. We also now have non-CDL. It's a much easier, it's much smaller, it's more of a shuttle service. It's gonna improve uh, our, our bus routes and transportation opportunities, and we wanna enhance that. So anyone that, that would want to CDL, we'd love to encourage you to get you into our district, but also, if you're willing to look at a little bit smaller type of, of suburban, van, smaller bus type of transportation, uh, it's a lot less intimidating. You still have training, but it's not to the CDL, and we'd love to hire you. Uh, within that, we have educational assistants, and those are educational assistants for. So that's TEAs that are on uh, our buses, and it's also our educational assistants within our buildings. So again, that's a great role to jump in and work with kids uh, and service uh, some of our, our best, uh, but students who also need uh, some extra support. We have the need for building engineers, custodians within our buildings. We have the need for nurses, and we also have specialty positions special education teachers, severe needs, and also psychologists. So again, as I say, this is a bit of information that we're going in that we're still looking for some positions. Uh, we also want to recruit, and please go to our website uh, to find those positions, take a look at them, and please apply. We'd love to have you. I'm going to build in uh, Rich Cosgrove now, if you'd come up, please. Next slide, 11, we're going to jump into a little bit of what I talked about with transportation. While we have done a good job in reorganizing our routes and prioritizing, Rich is going to talk a little bit about what that means to set up in our next steps. Rich. Rich Cosgrove is our Chief Operating Officer. Good evening, Rich. Good evening, Directors. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss transportation, give you a state of transportation as of today. Bus routes have been generally restored to the one and two mile walking zones approximately. We do have some areas, particularly in Parker, where we have walking zones that are a little beyond the two mile radius, depending on the uh, arterial roads be, and the neighborhoods, and most importantly on the limited number of bus drivers we have. Our overall head count is the same as last year, as it was in last May, but instead of being at the two mile distance from elementary schools and the three mile from high schools, we're at the one and two mile, We've done that by creatively consolidating routes. Unfortunately, what that results in is longer routes and fewer bus stops. We do not have, in general, in many areas, the same bus stops that we did last year, but we are making that distance to school much closer. Eligible parents have been able to see the routes and stops when they sign up for express check-in, or they can go to the transportation website. Once they sign up for SmartTag, they can also sign up for a portal that shows their route and that will give a daily update, not only the route times, but on the run times for that day for their students. Sorry, I was advancing two slides. We establish routes based on historic ridership. If, for example, there's 100 students that live in a transport zone, we know historically not all 100 ride. So we do schedule based on that historical information. We overbook just like airlines to a certain extent. And then on the first day of school, we are tracking the actual riders, the number that have signed up for SmartTag. As of yesterday, we had 2,200 riders on SmartTag. Today, we had 5,900. So we are tracking that and it is changing and it will continue to change through August and into early September. So we will be able to adjust our routes, most importantly to increase access to schools, but also so we don't have as many empty seats on the bus. We want to fill the buses. So we always flex that in the first month of the school. We're also maximizing the use of three third-party vendors for students with special needs. Many of these are one vehicle per student. Some of them are two. And that not only provides us flexibility transporting students with special needs, but it frees up drivers with commercial driver's license so they can drive a 77-passenger bus. We also, right now, we have five drivers that are driving uh, small buses that do not require commercial driver's license. So we're using them for the outlier routes and for small 14 passenger vehicles instead of a large bus. We continue to hire more staff, offer bonuses. We have a hiring bonus this year, whereas we didn't last year. We have a retention bonus that we've increased that we've always had, and we've instituted a retention bonus for transportation educational assistance. All that in an effort to continue to higher in this aggressive market. I hope that answers any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. We'll have an opportunity for questions here on any of this uh, in here, just a few slides. Slide uh, 13. 
as you start looking at our return, you know, as you've seen, as, we, as we've talked, we've had a, a forum in which to engage and share more information. Uh, one of the key things I, I want to point out, we have partnered all of last year, continue to partner in June, anticipating what the return could look like. Throughout July, past several weeks, and we'll continue, Tri-County supports where we are and we're aligned with their work. Dr. Douglas has shared that, that within the requirements and recommendations, um, where we are is as a county. There's not one perfect answer. It's complicated, it's complex. Each individual is in a unique spot. That opportunity for, for recommendation, choice, looking at each, but also to provide safety is what we're working on with each and every. We have multiple modalities within our district. In school, hybrid, online, and remote. We continue to have spots and availability. We continue to work with each of our schools on each situation and try to do our best to work through and find solutions. And as we do this, I just want you to know that we're doing it, uh, not only support learning, all students, but also we partner with Tri-County and work with the safety. We see many districts in multiple different spots. We see the need at, uh, of clarity and direction. I think within our, our plan, we have a strong plan. We are able to adjust and we're continuing to monitor our data. But I think in that piece, I'm very proud of, of the work that we go back to, what it takes to set up a school year. I can't say enough to all of our staff in our schools and in our buildings, the prep work it takes, and then to carry it over and you look at uh, the bus drivers, the staff in schools, uh, the teachers, the administration, uh, the work that gets that going. We've had a great first couple of days. We're looking forward to the rest of the week and the months to come. And I just want you to know as we look at this, uh, the, the neat thing about it is we're defining our metrics. We're defining our metrics with Tri-County. We have continued meetings with them, not only as our own district, but with our multiple districts of, of, of Tri-County, just to be able to share where we are with our data. We're all very similar in our, in our process uh, with students and schools uh, when you look at that. And, uh, and I think that's a, a testament to the work that it takes. Slide 14. You know, as we talked about, we do have layer mitigation uh, strategies. As you look at it, we had over 6,500 students in our schools this summer. We had ESY, summer school, extended learning, base. And within that, I want you to know that throughout the summer, you saw a pretty similar environment to what you see now. Some wore masks, some did not. Even with where we are with the Delta variant, I want you to know we're watching that. But we were very effective over the summer. Nothing's perfect, nothing's exact. But we had some work throughout, and we had a large number of students within our schools and we continue to work within good planning and work with Tri-County, and we're seeing that extended now. So I think in that side of, uh, I want to congratulate and say, you know, when you look at our vaccination numbers, I'm not here to get into whether you should or should not, but we're going to encourage. Vaccinations are a mitigation factor, and you look at we're over uh, close to 73% of, 73 and above, and you look at our student rate. That's a good positive in which to continue uh, to work this plan with Tri-County. And as Dr. Douglas said in our meeting, it puts us at a lower risk rate, but we're gonna have to monitor. But we're in a good spot now and able to move forward with that plan to keep looking. We still also offer a number of other mitigation factors. Uh, we have uh, increased HVAC uh, venting. We've had to work on some, uh, some of our HVAC units, but I'll tell you our own M team to be out at buildings and fix those quickly, uh, including uh, Prairie Crossing. We just heard word that it got fixed today. So in each of our schools that we were worried about even a full week and getting those, uh, still working on a few and, and adapting to those, but, but that's part of the work and people are responding to get that done. Uh, continue to increase ventilation along with frequent hand washing, hand sanitizers, we're trying to use space. So in our buildings, uh, how can we create space? And we're working with each individual to say, what is best for you? What will help you? When we say physical distancing, uh, it's not at that six feet or three feet where you're guaranteeing all that space. It's how do we work together to define our space and use it well? And so teachers, I encourage families to work with schools, their teachers, their admin, their support, trying to build in what's best for each and how do we look at uh, each situation in a classroom setting and so forth. Uh, our schools are, are working hard to put together a complicated situation again in another year, but they're doing a great job with that and I give kudos to them. Uh, so at this time, I'm gonna turn to slide 14 and open up for questions not only to me, but if uh, Rich or others uh, need to, we are more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Superintendent Wise. Directors, any quick clarifying questions of what we heard tonight in terms of back to school updates? Any, any questions? Director Holtzman? Yeah, 
I just wanted to start with the buses. Um, so I understand that we are looking at need based on distance away, like walking distance. I'm wondering if we've considered or pursued any further. I know at different times over the past year, we've talked about the possibility of carpools, um, perhaps the foundation helping us with those. Um, and I'm also wondering if, since we know that we still need drivers, if we need to look at other factors, such as possibly um, financial resources of the family. Uh, I don't know exactly how we would do that, but certainly if a family um, has one car versus two cars, it makes it more difficult to arrange schedules. So I'm just wondering if, if we've looked at either of those possibilities or, or other things, and I do appreciate the work. I know it's been very difficult, and um, we've been working hard to find more drivers. So. Yeah. Rich, if you'd like to come up, you're welcome to. I, I appreciate all those ideas. We'll, we have worked and are working with some, and with some even new ones, I think that's a piece of brainstorming uh, that Rich and team are always looking for. So we'll take those back to an Andy, Rich, uh, and our transportation crews along with schools, with families. So we'll work on that. Rich, anything else? Thank you, Director, for the questions. We're also looking at crosswalk guards across the district. We have hired a trainer to train crosswalk guards. Several schools have signed up. And these are not just crosswalk guards in the immediate area of the school, but along those entire boundary areas across major arterials. So that's another initiative. We have worked, we'll continue to work with the foundation. We did last year, funding was an issue. Um, so we'll continue to explore those. Thank you. Director Lung. Again, thank you very much for your hard work. Um, slide number six, uh, mental health. So I know that uh, fans for the voter to pass the meal and bond um, in 2018, we are able to have a counselor in every single school. Do we proactively identify a student um, that may need such kind of services and uh, to try to target um, the populations that is the most vulnerable and the most at risk um, after the social isolations last year? That's yeah, question great one. question. You know, when you start to call it our mental health, I want to say a big thank you. We, you know, Aaron Reagan, our district leadership uh, after the bond mill, we have added counseling uh, at every level elementary, middle school, high school. Uh, Aaron Reagan was a part of also getting another grant along with Zach Hess and Hans, Hans, Zach Hansen and uh, Zach Hess, sorry. <laughs> and when we look at that side, uh, we've increased the counseling support at the elementary levels. So when you look at both our mental health, our psychologists, social workers, counselors, along with all of our staff, Kevin, we are working hard to not only identify, but also do continuous check-ins. We're working on what does that look like daily, weekly, monthly, a system of that work. We're working on uh, identifying with families what support might have and then increase that wraparound. Uh, with our, also our, our work of our Douglas County partnerships, our Douglas County Youth Initiatives, we have wraparound services. We have family engagement that uh, we are educating not only our, our families but also our schools of additional supports within our community. So I want to give a shout out to the Douglas County Youth Initiative and all the work of those members uh, and uh, also uh, our schools that not only trying to work with each individual, but also extend that throughout uh, into the community. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I know the district is on the white path and um, I know some of those ideas, but so glad you mentioned all of those. So um, our general public knows that we're working very hard to make sure that all kids' mental health is being um, taken care of and in this new school years, and I was a seventh school yesterday during the first days of a school. And generally speaking, many of the parents and uh, teacher and student are very appreciative of what DCSD does and, and your wonderful uh, team doing this year's morale has never been higher, judging from uh, what I saw, and, and thank you very much. The second question that I have is uh, CDC released um, some sort of recommendations and um, recommending to have a vaccination clinic at school. Um, is this something, among other things that they recommended, is this something that, or I mean, what are the plan that we, um, as a school district, will do to promote vaccinations um, for our students and for the unvaccinated uh, staff? Uh, time and time over and over again, it proved that vaccinations is the number one key for us to go back to normal. Vaccinations is important. The more people vaccinated, the more we're going to go to uh, the herd effects, and the more we will be able to uh, 
very less about, you know, very, I mean, it really well really well with the Delta variant. So, so yes, yeah, so, so vaccinations is the key. So I just wonder, um, with the CDC guideline recommendations, uh, what else we will partner with to make sure that we recommend and promote vaccinations? Thank you. Yeah, great question. You know, since uh, March, we have been, uh, even before March, we've been not only trying to work with our health providers with vaccinations, providing opportunities and communicating out those opportunities. Parker, uh, uh, we have a number of relationships in Parker, Highlands Ranch and Cass Rock with vaccinations clinics and also uh, the ability to in which to partner uh, within our schools. I think the biggest piece is we have that. We've been sharing what those opportunities are and when, trying to get an advance notice to help families make the choice for the most convenience and opportunity for them. So yeah, we're gonna continue that and I can't say enough to everyone that reaches out to us and shares and partners with our families uh, to make those available. Uh, the, you know, the work ahead as you look at what's happening with vaccinations, when you look at approvals and also age, it's gonna continue. Uh, we are working with Tri-County about those along with CDPHE and CDC about uh, ongoing uh, opportunities for vaccinations. All right, Superintendent Wise, I think we're ready to move on to your next, oh, I'm sorry, I missed one question, thank you. Oh, so Director Hansen, then Director Holtzman, then we'll move on to your next, your next part. Hopefully just a quick question about busing. Um, last year when we had to drastically reduce bus routes, we had an opportunity for parents to apply for um, a special needs case, a special approval. Is that process still in place? Yes, yes, same okay. process, correct, Rich? Okay. Yep, same as last year. Our, and all of our principals are aware of exactly how to connect parents with whatever that process looks like so that I'm, I'm getting emails, um, I guess the board is getting emails from parents that are just very specific one-off situations and um, I'm not entirely sure where to send them. So I just wanna make sure that um, that communication is readily available. So we'll do twofold. Um, they can reach out to their schools and also to transportation, but we'll work on also increasing that communication out to principals, uh, office staff, answer communications and to our parents. So we have and will increase even further about that, that opportunity and, and the process to do that. Thank you. Absolutely. Director Holtzman, go ahead. Sure, and I think this will be quick also. It's basically a communications question. Um, I, I wanna say I appreciate definitely your partnership with Tri-County Health and, and also their partnership with us. Um, I talked to you briefly about this before, but for parents or community members that are looking for um, indicators of what Tri-County Health Department is monitoring in terms of is it the incidence rates for seven days or 14 days in Douglas County? Is it the test positivity? Um, we used to kind of, they provided to us and we linked from our website the school caution metrics. And I noticed the last they were updated was July 29th. And I just wondered, I know Dr. Douglas has been so gracious with his time, met um, publicly last week, has put out communications that he has looked at our plan and, and is supportive of it. But when I'm actually looking at what numbers he's monitoring, do you know if that's a tool that Tri-County will be using or, or where people should look? Yeah, I'll speak a little bit to what Dr. Doug spoke to the other night and where our continued work with them is. So some of the things that we are all looking at is that rate per 100,000 in the community, but also breaking down to what's happening in our schools. So we will take a look at what are the positivities. We will continue to communicate out if we have a positivity. And that allows us to track back to say, um, where is it happening? Is it in a classroom environment? Uh, is it in a, is it, uh, in a um, after school activity, club, sport, whatever else? And be able to work with Tri-County on those. We really wanna coordinate our efforts to see if the transmission uh, is happening and where. So I think on those things, an outbreak. Uh, you know, what you might think of as an outbreak and what's defined as an outbreak is five. But what we're trying to work on is defining where are those five. So some of those metrics get into uh, each individual school situation, classroom situation, grade level. Um, sometimes it's a sport. And so I think in each of those, when we're working with Tri-County. We were working with them on the caution metric. We've asked a little bit of where are we now? You know, we have past practice we've learned from it, but also what are our metrics in which we have? I think it's important as we start talking within each of our schools and grade levels, that's what we're defining with them. And then also at times they have to define back to us. And in all reality right now, we're working with a lot of recommendations and very few requirements. We've gone above and beyond not only to work with each of those, but to get the approval and process. So Tri-County has helped us be at this point. They've helped us have 
uh, the level of safety and work within that. And I think they're gonna continue to work within that. But looking at those data points and really measuring those out and seeing what's happening now and in the future is gonna be important. But those are some of the criteria that we see uh, when you look at positivity. Um, they have come back to talk about isolation. There has been talk with CDPHE and, and Tri-County with quarantines, we're waiting for more updates and that's probably more on, on um, possibly PE, musics, exertion, sports, uh, but we're waiting and anticipating what that could be and uh, whether it's recommendation guidance uh, requirements within that and partnering with them to define. Thank Absolutely. you, Superintendent Wise. All right, where we move on to your next topic, sir. Absolutely, and uh, you know, as we take a look at our next topic, uh, we'd like to share a little bit more about uh, safety and security within our Douglas County School District. I'm gonna ask uh, Deputy Superintendent Andy Abner to come up and share a little bit of a celebration of where we are now uh, within our work and, and our staff and our next steps. Andy? All right. Thanks, Corey. Yep. Good evening, President Ray and uh, Board of Directors. I wanna thank you guys for this opportunity to be here. Um, if we could please move to slide two. I am so pleased to announce that Johnny Grusing um, is our new Director of Safety and Security. Here's a nice picture of Johnny. Um, he, he, is, he is also live. Oh, there he is right there, look at. And the picture lines up, that's perfect. I'll, I'll call on you in here just a minute, Johnny. I'll explain why you're in a car somewhere to, to everyone as well. But Johnny served as a special agent with the FBI since 1996. And during that time, he's held various roles, including behavior analysis unit coordinator, a primary defensive tactics instructor, which I heard a lot about, some really good stories at his retirement party, and the uh, primary relief supervisor for the violent crimes and public corruption units. Johnny's nationally recognized in public and private sectors as an investigator and expert interviewer who has successfully resolved some of the most prolific crimes here in the state of Colorado. Uh, he has spent 25 years in the FBI and has the past 10 years training law enforcement, educational institutions, and corporations across the nation how to apply the principles of the FBI's behavioral analysis unit and threat management, violence prevention, and criminal investigations. And as the former principal of Rock Canyon High School, I was very fortunate to attend some of Johnny's uh, trainings and they were incredibly informative and certainly helped me in my role with that. So we, are, we feel very fortunate to have Johnny joining our team. Um, Johnny is in a car on, uh, on Zoom with us right now um, because he was testifying all day today in Salida, Colorado for the Suzanne Morphew case um, that many of you are probably familiar with from the from the news stories with that. So with that being said, I'll let Johnny say a few words and, and say hello to, to you all virtually. Yeah, well, hello. I would much rather have been at your Board of Education meeting than in the courtroom today, but <laughs> that's where I was. And uh, I got to uh, experience the first full week with Douglas County Schools. It was a great week. I got around to meet a lot of principals, met the security staff I'll be working with. Uh, Rich Payne has been very good at helping me learn the ropes, and I really look forward to meeting you guys and working with you guys this year. Thank you, Johnny. Safe travels to you on your drive home here tonight. Thank you, appreciate it, Andy. All right, so with that being said, and a great segue, I would now like to bring Rich Payne up to the podium here, um, and I'd like to thank Rich. Rich has done a tremendous job of helping us transition over to Johnny as our new safety and security director, and Rich continues to help educate us on everything that he had going and helps bring Johnny up to speed with where we are on things. So we really appreciate that collaboration and that partnership, and we really appreciate Rich being here tonight to give you all an update on where we currently sit with our safety and security and many of the projects that we have going on across our school district. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> so good evening, Board of Directors and President Ray. Um, I first want to start off by saying uh, thank you for the last seven years. The last seven years of working collaboratively with the present board, prior boards, safety and security, when it tags along any communication that comes out in the school district, there's no joke. We hold safety and security as the highest priority, making sure our kids are safe. It's very evident, safety and security, kids feel safe in school. We have the highest test scores. We have also the highest graduation rates, and that's a reflection of kids feeling safe to come to schools. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview of exactly where we're at. Remember, we actually had the bond election in 2018. It's a five-year bond. We had lots of things that we had identified through our safety security committee. So for the folks that are out listening, 
that don't know, we actually have a 28 member group as safety security. It's a combination of all of our law enforcement officers. I mean, our, the sheriff, chiefs of police, fire chiefs. We have mental health experts, Department of Human Services. We have principals from every level and the list goes on. We have two members of the school board that actually sit as advisors onto the safety security committee. And the direction that we take is driven from the committee. So when we see a project or somebody says, hey, what about this? I would do the research on it. I would present it to the school board. Also, this goes on the mental health side as well. And the school or the safety security committee would then come out and say, do we think it's sustainable? Can we sustain this? And can we keep this going for years and years? And also, does our law enforcement partner and everybody involved, do we have the capacity? So with everybody on that school safety committee, we make a decision and then we move forward. We voted it as a group. So for the public to understand that there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes to make sure that where we're at in safety and security is not just being driven from the top down, it's being driven as a collaborative group of members across. I did forget to mention, we also do have uh, several community members on that, that actually one family from uh, the Sandy Hook tragedy, tragedy and we also have a representative from the Columbine tragedy as well. So when we talk about putting things in place, it's always driven through our committee. So the 2018 to, to 23 bond, there was a lot of things that we had picked out uh, in the 2017 school year, what we needed to upgrade, where we needed to go forward. So some of the big projects were secure front, high, um, front end high and middle school entryways. This actually builds a front entryway to where the officers that work in the schools, they can actually stop a person from entering into the building. And so if a person comes in, they actually have magnetic holds and things that can actually stop and prevent that person from getting in the building so that we will not have a tragedy inside the building. Uh, the other, some of the other things real quick, there was vehicles that were purchased. Our fleet of vehicles, we do have a patrol division. Um, we have, we're 850 square miles. We have officers that are constantly driving around assisting at schools, helping out principals for different things. So we were able to purchase vehicles to upgrade our uh, patrol fleet as well. Window film, we talk about window film and it's that's target hardening. Window filming is, I mean, this was all over the news after Sandy Hook. During Sandy Hook, the bad guy got into the building as a result of shooting the window next to the door and the doors were all locked, but the window and he was able to walk right in. So this is another uh, system or project that we had in place to make sure that uh, this wouldn't happen in our schools. And so we have specific uh, requirements now that we have for all of our different projects. Um, and it's standard across the district. And when I say standard across the district, one of the greatest things that we've been able to accomplish in the district is that all charter schools and all traditional schools are under the same umbrella. So as large as the county is, we are able to make sure that when officers are responding to any type of a situation, they're seeing the exact same thing at every single school. It's not a surprise that one school has this and another school doesn't have that certain thing. We've been able to standardize it across the board. And I will tell you that working on this over the last seven years, it's incredible. We have great people in this county. We have great principals. Everybody's at the table when we're making these decisions. The law enforcement partners, everybody is on board with everything that we're doing to make sure that when we're running a project and making kids safe, that we focus on it and everybody's pitching in and working on it. Let's see if I can get this. So one of the largest, oh, it went back. You got it, you got it. Are you fine? All right, I'll just let you do it. I'll give you the cue. So back in the day, we didn't have someone like you to do that. I just sit up there and do this. So, um, So go to five. five. Yep. No, actually go back to four. Sorry. Just... <laughs> okay. So the window filming, uh, this project has been completed. And I'll tell you that this project, we had a standard for window film in the district. And with the county commissioner's funding, which I'll speak about here in a minute, we were able to take additional funds and put the best product on the market within our schools. I won't get into all the details on that. Under state law, we do not share our safety and security practices under the Safe School Act. And so we don't tell you exactly what it is. I can just tell you that 
We have really good stuff in place. Matter of fact, the company that is currently doing the capital building right now is the company and the product that is doing that has done the schools through this project, so we're able to upgrade it with commissioner's funding. The camera grades, uh, the VMS system, um, the VMS is the vid vid video management system behind the scenes, and that's additional cameras. We now are up to close over 4,000 cameras within the district. We have another whole new standard. Every school has 95% coverage on the interior of the building and 90% coverage on the exterior of the building. We have really great features, and we didn't realize this, but during COVID tracing, they actually came into, there's analytics that we can actually highlight a person and follow them through the building. So if a bad guy does get in our building, we know exactly where that person is at real time. And we did this as a result of what happened in Parkland. Once again, we're looking at research-based programs and stuff in Parkland. They were given information to law enforcement officers and they were 12 minutes behind because there was a delay. So the guy wasn't even there and they were sending guys over there. Where our new system, we can actually send somebody, that person will be right there because we can actually follow them and monitor them around through that deal. It actually worked very well for what I was told by the elementary schools for COVID tracing. So when they had to go back and they were doing all the COVID tracing, they could actually go back and say, okay, this student was sitting next to this student stuff in the lunchroom. And so the systems are just very, very up to date. To date, um, and once again, this is across the board, traditional schools and charter schools. To date, we have pulled over 156 miles of cable for this to be in our system, in all the schools. So when, this, when the whole project is completed, which should be here probably in the next four months, um, we'll have actually pulled over 200 miles of cable at all the schools. So that's pulling up ceiling tiles, getting up there. It, it takes a little time to do that at school, so there's a lot of work behind the scenes. Access control across the district was also updated. Access control is the, the flashcards you see on the wall. That, our old system was antiquated. It was from 1999 or 1996 and it had a 10,000 card capacity. We were also able to put all new access control with the bond funding. And once again, access control is at our traditional schools and our, our charter, charter schools as well. So now law enforcement officers, anyone that's assigned to the schools, all of our SROs, they have one card to get in. This goes back to this, the STEM incident. The only one that could get in was one of the, the lieutenant who actually had a card that she could get in the building because the cards weren't available. So we have taken that, looked at it, fine-tuned it, and now it'll go down to one card, and that one card works for anybody in the district if there's an emergency response. Next slide. Okay, um, the school VMS camera update, I kind of talked about that. What I will tell you is if you're in DIA, the same camera system that's monitored you in DIA, is the same system that we actually have here. I went up and looked at it and said, that's what I want. And I want it to be a one click, not where you're having to look and drag things. It's a one click system. So it's so user friendly for all of our principals and anybody that's using that at an elementary level all the way up through the high school level. All right, and then access control once again, the full replacement, we're through this project and that's district wide and with charters. And so we're working on that as well. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So county or the Board of County Commissioners Safety Grant. We'll back up to how this came about. We were given $6.8 million by the county commissioners. $6 million was given towards the, uh, for physical target hardening, stuff to do with physical safety. And there was $800,000 that was given to uh, the mental health team to work with uh, different mental health contracts, the UCRT program and different things that were initiated. As far as on the commissioner side, they actually put together a group of nine people from the community, people who have very, very, um, I would say impressive resumes. The leader of the whole, the, the, the lead of the commissioner's group was a man by the name of Clint Doris. Clint Doris is a retired military officer, um, or right, retired from the military. He was a Delta, Delta Force officer and he also ran security for NASA for multiple years. So he actually was the leader of that. This group got together for two weeks. They read over 4,000 documents and they turned around and met with myself and President Ray, Dr. Tucker at the time. We had multiple meetings and 
we looked through their, what their recommendations were, and then we had to go back to the commissioners. And when the whole thing was said and done, there was a group of about 12 recommendations that the group came up with to say that this is what we could use the funding for and to enhance some of the stuff that we currently had in the school district that we were working on in the bond program. So with that, we ended up, uh, well, I'd go back and say that when Clint Doris, uh, the head of Homeland Security that's in this region, and they were all part of this team that came together, he got up in front of the school board commissioners and when his presentation that night was, I will just tell you from my lens, from Homeland Security, from everybody, your kids are very, very, very safe in this district. We have really good stuff already in place and these were just enhancements. So when this comes down to where we worked with the commissioners and they actually picked the eight projects that we would use the funding. One was communications systems. So you see it's an installation of radio infrastructure in high schools and larger schools. Keep in mind, this is a large tag price tag in this whole thing. This was actually enables in our buildings and across the district for first responders from police officers, firemen, anybody that's on the district-wide radio system, the state emergency system, to have better reception in areas that we do not have some communication problems in large buildings. So um, that was one of the big tags. Uh, radios, they also provided us with some um, funding to make sure that we put a second um, emergency radio in every single um, high school and middle school and the charter schools. So we wanted to make sure that the larger schools actually had two or three radios in the buildings. So to give you a little bit of history on the radios, about four years ago, we put a system in place working with the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, a radio system where we put an emergency radio system and a radio in every single high school and elementary school and charter school and even public schools or private school, I'm sorry, private schools within the county because it was all come underneath the 911 board. And that system we put in place, it was a click of a button is how we communicate now. No more phone calls. I won't talk a lot about a STEM, but I will tell you the STEM incident, which is a huge tragedy. Officers were inside the building after a click of the push of the radio in less than a minute and 30 seconds. Across the country, people are saying, how were you guys able to accomplish that? Once again, it comes back to working collaborative with all of our partners and everybody in the same board. At the same time, the original rollout on that did not cost the school district a thing. The 911 board the, funded the original program, which was close to a million dollars to put radios, emergency radios within the schools. So um, the exterior door alarms, this is all tied into uh, our camera systems. Now, if a door gets propped open, it actually, if there's a camera right up here and this door gets propped open, an outside door, the camera will come on. It'll alert the security team. It's so sophisticated, it actually can go right to the principal's cell phone. So if they're walking around the building, and then we can radio communicate to find out why. And then the camera actually will tell us who puts that in place, you know, who opened it, who propped the door. Because we all know from prior incidents that have happened, propping doors is how bad guys have got in. And so we do have a district policy that we're not allowed to prop doors and we do adhere to it. And so that's a conversation that principals will actually have with their staff. We're not there to penalize people, it's just to educate and make sure that everybody understands that we have procedures for a reason. So, um, next slide. Door locks, the, um, uh, we found out during STEM, when everybody was locked down, that we did not have keys to go through and open up classroom doors. So. This project right here was to be able to put systems in place in the schools so that if every school, so that if we ever have another incident that happens, that there's multiple keys that are available for law enforcement responders. And so we have keys and stuff. Um, this, this one has taken a little longer to get going because to buy that many safes and to get the best price, um, we finally have them, they're all arrived. And I wish I had a picture of the warehouse over next to security, it is lined with radios and safes and everything else ready to get rolled out. Um, defend training was another one of their deals that they uh, picked. The defend training was actually not for uh, really the schools. It was actually for all the law enforcement officers to be trained under a certain guideline so that every officer that was out had the same training that our SWAT officers and stuff had when they're coming. We did two of the trainings uh, were completed and those were trained to trainers and that project is ongoing, making sure we're doing that. The emergency response training, this was a three-year 
designed to be a three-year multi-agency training with local law enforcement um, to make sure that everybody was uh, involved. We did a multi-agency training this year over at Echo Park, one that we've never done before at a stadium. We've always done them inside the buildings. We've done some trainings, but this is an ongoing uh, project to where we can reimburse law enforcement and stuff for overtime and stuff, or if we need food and water at the trainings. And so this is just overall global stuff that we're doing within the county. So next slide. Uh, once again, the commissioners, they were able to provide us extra additional funding that for our ballistic window hardening stuff, emergency trauma kits, the, every school has a stop the bleed kit. Um, a lot of the high schools have two stop the bleed kits. The staff has been trained by our school nurses. Uh, we're, they're out training different um, like coaches and stuff so that everybody is, uh, if something happens that they're available to use the kits and that they can start using the kits before first responders get there and fire guys or the fire guys can actually use the same kits. So that has been completed in all the schools. The Ballers program, this was a big deal that was a push by Homeland Security was making sure that we have things where nobody could take a car through our front doors is to make that. Uh, this turned out to be kind of unique is because we looked at the cost for bollards to make a metal bollard in front of, a, you know, you see them in front of all the, the stores. Well, we realized that we have two vocational programs here in Douglas County. We have one over at Ponderosa High School and we have at Douglas County High School and metal shops. So to buy a bollard was about 600 and something dollars. We can actually have them made at school, at the schools for about $100 a piece. So always looking to make sure that we're using all of our money uh, to the best of our capabilities. And so this project's underway. And this will also put a couple other things around buildings, um, just you know, like landscaping boulders and stuff like that. Next slide, please. Is that it? OK. So, um, so to end, once again, I would like to say thank you for having the opportunity to come back and uh, work with you. Um, I am, it's, people are saying, wow, we're shocked you're here. What's the deal? Why are you here presenting? So the transition, when I knew I was leaving, um, it was kind of late in the game when I was leaving. I left the district for personal reasons. Um, I'll probably get a little emotional here. Uh, <clears throat> my parents are getting older. With COVID, my dad was put in a facility and, and the, it was 15 months that he was in a facility and I got to see him for 10 minutes. And uh, during this transition, he passed. And so right now, just being there for my mom and being strong, that's, when, that's the main reason that I actually left and went to take on a new job that was closer to home and things like that. Uh, I've been working behind the scenes with, uh, well, Corey Wise, President Ray, to make sure that this transition moves smoothly. We have about $20 million worth of projects that we are working on the security side, and those fell under myself. I know President Ray is not involved with that, but he was involved with that. He and I had so many meetings with the county commissioners just to make sure that we are doing the right thing and keeping them informed of where we're using their money. and so. When I, was, when I ended up getting another position and ended up leaving, my goal was to make sure that we continue to keep everything moving forward. And so that's why the transition plan is in place. I think people were a little shocked when I left and they said, that's so weird as I would get emails or calls back from people and they'd say, wow, it's so weird. All of your, your email address and all your stuff still works. So, and that was because we had a plan in place. The plan was that I was going to tradition or transition with the new director, whoever was selected, and I would stay on if it's one month, two months, to make sure that that person feels comfortable to where they're at and to make sure that all of our projects and stuff are going. So that's kind of the, the story behind the scene of you know, why I'm here and why when people still email me or if I email them and they're like, he don't even work here anymore, how come this? So <laughs> technically I do. So I'm just working hand in hand with the school district just to make sure. And once again, I want to thank everybody. And the mostly, I would love to thank the citizens of Douglas County for, for voting and getting the bond in place. I will leave you with the last thing is was through the cops office. And that was to uh, have our district featured as one of the top security districts in the nation to be a model. Well, COVID put a stop on that for about 
16 months. It's back up and running. I just was contacted last week. I spoke to Corey. Um, I spoke to President Ray. Um, we, in January, that training is coming around. It involves a secret service, involves everybody. That has to do with school safety and security from the federal level. And they will actually feature one of our schools will be here along with 12 other school districts from across the country, from California, everywhere else. And the training will actually be done here in Douglas County. So that whole program is underway as well. So once again, thank you. And Don't go any away. questions? <laughs> well, Rich, uh, on behalf of all of us, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you how, how incredibly grateful we have been for your seven years of service. Um, you have indeed made this a lighthouse district when it comes to security um, because of all the things you have done. And, and I appreciate you sharing the personal story because I think you know, certainly there are some, some uh, misinformation out there. We tried to figure out how to move our district down to Colorado Springs, but we just couldn't. That was the one thing we couldn't do. Uh, and, and if we could, we would have gotten, clo gotten us closer to you, uh, to your home. But, um, and, our, and, and also our condolences um, for your father. Um, and, and we know you're doing this for all the right reasons um, in terms, and I, I am just so grateful that you are so intentional about every step you make to ensure our kids remain safe, right down to working with our new security director. And I believe we have you on retainer, so we're not gonna say goodbye. We're gonna see you again uh, periodically just to ensure that everything continues to go forward as planned. So. On behalf of, of, of all of us, uh, thank you for your service. We wish you well in your new position. And if there's ever a chance for us to steal you back, just know we're, we're going to do it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Any, any quick questions for, uh, yeah, and let's give yeah. Director of Security. Now, Rich is going to be mad at me because he promised I wouldn't do that. So, um, so I, I'm not going to let you get one on me. So uh, <laughs> it is about the teams that are here in this school district, the principals, every teacher that keeps and now has a new role, and that's being a, a protector before they're an educator. So the calls I would get from parents is, I'm moving into the district. Or is my kid going to be safe? They're not asking me about Math 101 or this. They're asking that question. And I would tell them, yes. They are safe. Our schools are very, very safe. So it comes back to a team. All I did was at the top and try to navigate things and make sure that everybody could do it together. But it's a team of all 8,000 employees in this district that have kids in their hearts and are here for the right reason. So thank you. Thank you, Rich. All right. Very good. Again, uh, we're going to turn it back over to Andy Abner. And I think, oh, no, I, I just saw you walking up to the uh, podium. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Deputy Superintendent Danelle Hyatt. All right. Ms. Yeah, Hyatt. You, you get me now after Rich. I don't know about that. I mean, that <laughs> That's was all right. A tough act. It was, it's always so good to see Rich. So good evening, everybody. Thank you um, for allowing me to share some updates on some proposed plans around our parent family staff engagement sessions that we have tentatively drafted coming up. And first, I'd like to just start with a, a huge thank you to our parent community. Having been in so many of our schools yesterday and seeing the first day for our kids, we recognize that there's quite a significant transition that happens in the homes to get kids ready for back to school. And um, it was just a sincere pleasure to be able to um, see some very happy, smiling faces by our parent community, see our parents interacting with our staff, our administrators, and ensuring that our kids we're ready to go on the first day of school. And so um, that is just, again, a huge uh, gratitude from this entire team to our parent uh, community. And really what I'd like to share this evening is just an update in, in terms of how we plan to continue to engage with our, not only our parent community, our families um, and our staff. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
So the, the work around engagement is really aligned with our Board of Education in statement and goals. I mean, this has definitely been a priority for the Board of Education around those collaborative parent, family, and community relations. We talked about this last June, last June being two months ago. Feels like a little bit of time ago. We gave a bit of an update in, in terms of what our um, engagement strategies were from last year and kind of what our, our our plans were for this year and so this is an update but always appreciate that we prioritize the opportunities to engage uh, with our parents our families and our staff in this community we really want to hear those voices that helps us to support the individual educational experiences of our students um, and there's a lot of different pathways for communication when it comes to engagement. This evening I'll share a few different um, plans, but that is definitely not intended to be an all-inclusive um, overview of everything that we're doing around engagement. We recognize that there are many different pathways around engagement uh, for our parents, our families, our community members, our district employees, and really ensuring that we do so with kindness in respect, and that is definitely a part of your indicators for success uh, as aligned with your board goals around collaborative parent, family, and community relations. Next slide, please. We also, of course, as you very well know, um, have a parent uh, engagement policy. And this is, again, just an emphasis that we recognize that there are many different ways that we partner with our families and with our staff. Some of those ways that we partner are district level opportunities, uh, the forums as we did last week, um, educational um, learning opportunities for parents that we offer through the district communications department. But we also honor and respect that many of our parents and our families and our staff prefer to partner directly with school-based administrators, with the staff in our schools. And so we always want to be really cognizant that we're offering a variety of different pathways um, with our work in which our families and our parents and our staff can engage with us. Um, it's very collaborative in nature and we want to encourage that collaboration. And when I speak about collaboration, it's about listening, it's about developing empathy, it's about building positive intent with the focus of our efforts on behalf of our kids and then being able to respond based on that. Sometimes that's complicated as we recognize, but that is really the intention of the opportunities we want to provide in our community. Next slide, please. So some proposal in some, uh, in some additional areas that we're really exploring as we look at uh, first semester and second semester plans. And, is that we really want to have an ongoing focus around engagement with our parents, with our families, and with our staff in regards to two really critical areas that, you're, that you will hear more about in a minute, one of them being special education and one of them being compensation. So hold there, we'll go into that a little bit more in depth in just a minute. In terms of other forum opportunities we are exploring offering in semester one, as you are all very well aware, we did hold our back to school forum last week where Superintendent Wise was able to provide some very relevant, important information to our community about our COVID protocols, some transportation updates, and resources for students. And our intention on that was to really start the school year with giving parents the opportunities and our families the opportunities to hear some really important, relevant information uh, and be able to submit questions to us that they were hoping to have answers to that we answered in that forum and then have responded to um, based on other communications mechanisms that we have. In semester one, we are planning also to um, hold a forum around safety and security. As you just heard um, from um, Deputy Superintendent Abner, we do have a new director of security, Mr. Johnny Grusing, and we would love the opportunity to be able to introduce him to our community and engage in a conversation about safety and social emotional learning. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we intend also to uh, host uh, an opportunity to engage around the conversation about academic excellence in Douglas County School. How are we supporting uh, the needs of all of our students and what opportunities and pathways do we have as we support our students? And then another um, 
uh, opportunity that we plan to, to engage in is educational equity and inclusive excellence. And that is something that we had shared with the Board of Education last spring, and we will continue to update you in terms of our intentions and our efforts in that area. Semester two, um, we will um, engage in forums around career and technical education and all of the different pathways uh, that we have um, available to our students, as well as budget and finance becomes a very important topic in the second semester and providing those opportunities for engagement um, in that regard as well. And so with that next slide, please, I'm gonna turn it over to Superintendent Wise to talk a little bit about um, our back to school community forum um, from last week. Thank you. Um, you know, as we talked about our first forums, there's many reasons which we engage. And one of the things that we notice if we go to uh, look at this, the first part is we come into the start of the school year. We're under uh, you know, ever-changing environment. You look at dynamics of the nation, to the state, to the number of school districts, uh, health departments, and to be accurate in information. You know, truly we talked and we felt a need, a need to reach out to engage, to share more about where we are and why. That it's not an individual, you don't operate in isolation. It's not just a board making decisions, this is a staff operational that we work hand in hand with CDC, CDPG, through Tri-County Health. And as we look at that, how we work with our families, work with our schools. You know, I understand uh, pressure, I understand emotion, but we also learned a lot in that process. This purpose was to give more information, to invite out RSVP to get questions, to share more. And then we also have to look at what are our next steps. Each forum will probably look very unique depending on the topic. But I think the key things coming out of that to share you know, how we go about our work, how we work through challenges, how do we address concerns, different opinions, listen and find solutions, work together, create understanding. We're gonna work hard to create narratives, explain uh, where we are and why, but also build in those opportunities, both larger group and smaller group to have round tables and forums. But in this first one, you know, the, the great part, in a matter of a week of turnaround and saying there's a need, there's a need where we have a lot that want to have required mass and a need of a lot that, that want to have a recommendation and choice to say, I need to get in front. And I think there are a lot of pods that came out of it, even in a challenging night. But I think a lot of pods where each and every person has a chance to learn and grow, and we'll get better at this. And we're gonna set norms, work together to identify. But in that, you know, we had not only 628 uh, uh, RSVPs, but we had 210 in person. We had at least 327 live stream. We aren't sure about the 148. But I think in those, uh, you know, the purpose of that was more of a sharing of information, try to get questions and uh, so forth, and then set ways afterwards to engage and answer more questions, and also partner families with schools. And I, that's a continued work that we are, are going to continue to ask. Um, how we work with our schools in these situations, how we as a district can also support, and how we continue to work with Tri-County. In talking with Dr. Douglas almost daily at times, uh, we are in a good spot with our plans. We're in accordance with Tri-County. Whether you say approve or support, they're hand in hand with us. And I think it was neat to hear him share that because I think there's oftentimes misinformation around that. And when we say Dr. Douglas, it's his entire team. But we'll continue to meet uh, individually with our own data and also work with other school districts. What do we notice? What do we see is coming? So we are hopefully not as many surprises. Hence, as we go, what I'd ask of everyone is we have a strong plan to move forward. I'd ask to assume positive and not jump to conclusions work with the facts we have, and we'll continue to communicate it out if or when there would be any changes. But I don't want us to jump to, to conclusions or assumptions because oftentimes that's uh, based off of misinformation. And it's gonna be a work together, and it's gonna evolve. So as we go to slide eight, I wanna really take a second and ask Mr. Reynolds to come up to talk about a little bit about um, within academic excellence, the opportunities that we may have in front of us as just a potential topic, and then we'll get into each of the others uh, that we have more intentionality that we said that we are going to engage with, but it gives an idea of what we have and different uh, opportunities throughout this year. Thank you, uh, President Ray, Board of Directors. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, in alignment to uh, the board ends and also with uh, Superintendent Wise priorities, one of our major projects this year, as we've talked about, is the implementation of core reading programs across our elementary schools. Uh, currently, we have two core reading programs that are being piloted in several of our schools. Uh, they'll be piloted throughout the, this fall. Now, how does that tie into engagement? 
Um, at the end of September, we're asking both of these um, vendors to come through and provide an opportunity at night for community members and parents to learn more about the programs. Those will happen at the end of September. Uh, we're also gonna look for having physical copies of those in several locations around our district, as well as having a website available on our um, a district page for people to be able to view online versions of those resources to learn more about those programs. Uh, we're really excited about um, having the opportunity of having a core programs across all of our elementary schools. It's a very exciting thing for us. So when you look at the um, bullet list there, you know, we certainly are looking at uh, programs that are state approved and also Board of Education approved and their alignment with um, the Colorado academic standards. And so um, this will not be the last time that you hear from me on this project because it's a major project. Um, and I also want to take the, the opportunity to thank you all um, this last spring of, of putting forth that allocation for us to be able to do this work. Um, it's very exciting and we're looking forward to engaging our parents and our staff um, on making that decision come this spring. So this won't be the last time you hear from me. So thank you. If you could go back to slide seven, please. Thank you. As I also had already uh, mentioned, our intention in September is to host an opportunity uh, to engage on the topic of safety, as we just heard a very, uh, a very comprehensive overview of some of our uh, physical safety measures that we are currently in process of. We also want to be able to engage with our community in regards to social emotional learning in Douglas County School District and what that actually means. Um, kind of uh, the what is SEL and what is not social emotional learning in Douglas County School District. And so that is our intention in September. Of course, we will always tie those conversations to, as, as Matt said, the Colorado academic standards because uh, social emotional learning does live in the Colorado uh, comprehensive health and social emotional wellness standards. And we want to be able to um, share more about that with our community, as well as what curriculum supports and resources we we are utilizing in our schools, how they support our students, and then engage in, in further conversation about what mental health supports we have available and all of those partnerships that you heard earlier as well that we have within our community to be able to support our students in regards to not only their mental health but also uh, psychological safety and social emotional learning. And so that is the intention of our September uh, forum. In terms of what that actual forum will look like, we recognize that we will want to differentiate that based on what we're hearing our community's needs are, are in this area. So when we do send out an RSVP form with questions beforehand, that is really helpful to us because we do want to be able to utilize that information as we, as we customize what that engagement experience will look like. Of course, there will, there will likely be information sharing as part of it, but we do want to have an opportunity where we can answer questions or engage in roundtable conversations based on what our parents, our families, our staff's needs are in those areas. And so more about the very specific structure to come in regards to that, but we do encourage our families to be able to give us that feedback when we are planning for forums because that does actually help us um, to develop those themes and those topics, et cetera. All right, next slide, please. This is uh, educational equity in inclusive excellence. This is, uh, this is very familiar information to the Board of Education. This is very consistent to what we shared with all of you last spring, as well as our community. We, uh, our intentions in quarter one is to build our leadership capacity in common understanding of educational equity and inclusive excellence in Douglas County School District based on the Board of Education policy. And as you very well know, there is a lot of different vocabulary and definitions within our policy in terms of what equity means to us, 
what it means in terms of inclusivity, accessibility. And our intentions in this first quarter is to really build the leadership capacity and common understanding of the language we're utilizing as we talk about equity in Douglas County School District. And so that is really the focus of quarter one's work around engaging with our leaders around this conversation, as well as our staff. Additionally, we continue to analyze our data. As you know from um, Mr. Reynolds, data analysis is, is very rich right now, especially with some of our most recent uh, state assessment data. And so our intention is to be able to look at that data. Our schools are looking at that data. Our schools are engaging with school accountability committees around their data to be able to identify those areas where they are, are seeing strengths and celebrations as well as challenges, and where what might we see different uh, student groups um, and what might be some gaps we need to address. And so that is part of the work of quarter one when it comes to educational equity um, in, in the focus of our work. That is currently in progress as we speak. Next slide, please. Additionally, we are in the process of uh, working to create the Equity Advisory Council with, through the bylaws. We're working on bylaws as well as a membership um, com um, composition of the Education uh, Equity Advisory Council and then the selection process for members. Again, that is in process. That Equity Advisory Council hasn't been yet determined. I think there's a little bit of mixed messaging on that. We are in process of uh, identifying that structure, those bylaws, the membership. Our intention to ha is to have that information ready to communicate to our communities, uh, community and those people that are interested in it by the end of quarter one. So that is what's in process. And then uh, we are working with our school leaders as well as our teachers around controversial topics and resources. That is not brand new to us. We know that there are times where our parent uh, community or our students want to engage with our staff or administrators around questions or concerns around controversial topics. And so we encourage that partnership between parents, our building teachers and administrators around any questions or concerns. And that has, again, been uh, an emphasis in some communication uh, recently as well with our building leaders. In terms of quarter two, and this is again consistent with what we shared with you last spring, uh, we do plan to engage in student and family listening supports or roundtable conversations around educational equity and what that means for our parent community, the feedback, the questions, the wonderings, and the concerns. And so that is our intention in November is to create those roundtable opportunities. It is yet to be decided whether we will do that based on school or region. We have a lot of conversations um, to have in terms of what that specifically will look like, but that is definitely the intention of our work going into quarter two. And then, of course, we're going to continue to consult with and gather expertise from our partners at uh, the Colorado Department of Education, those, those um, colleagues who are doing similar work in other districts to be able to glean um, the best practices in some of these areas. So that's a work in progress as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with special education, I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Sid Rendell, our Chief Special Education Officer. Services Officer. Services Officer, I know it's- CISO. <laughs> Thank you, uh, President Ray and uh, board members. Uh, but before I give you just a quick highlight of kind of some of the thinking that we're marinating on right now, I, I did want to also throw in a plug earlier because we have a new, as we got to meet our new Director of, of Security, um, Johnny Grusing, I wanted to also say part of his resume that was not mentioned that I think is incredibly relevant and important is his most important um, boss in duty is uh, to his wonderful wife who is a middle school science teacher. <laughs> and uh, I will always throw in a plug for middle school teachers. And uh, <laughs> undoubtedly she will uh, remind him of all of the mistakes he's making. Um, so the, the answer to the question, um, you know, what, what, is the, what is the plan for uh, increasing our community engagement? What is our, what is our thinking about uh, having a more rich and robust relationship with our special ed community, our parents, our teachers, all of the stakeholders? The answer to that is yes. 
Uh, the answer to that is a definitive, we acknowledge this is a growth opportunity for us. This is something we're, we're deeply committed to. And so this, I, I wanna preface by saying, this is a beginning point. I think there's going to be great uh, uh, transformational growth to this as well. But this is kind of some of the stuff that uh, my directors, my team and I are working on right now. Um, the Douglas County Special Education Advisory Committee, DCCAC, um, a, a very, very important uh, committee, a very important uh, function, very similar to our SACs or our DAC. It's, uh, it's got its own bylaws, it's got its own officers, its own membership. So it gives a really rich and uh, purposeful opportunity for dialoguing with, with myself and my directors and members of, of the team in terms of what are they seeing? What are they hearing? What do they want us to know about that might be blind spots for, for us? So that's a really important um, committee that's out there and something that we very, very much are going to, to uh, um, take, take extreme advantage of. Uh, they also have a presence on our district website. So for those who, who might be watching this, that's how you can gain information as to when they're starting a meeting, I think next week, uh, their first meeting. So, so please check that out on the website and, and get all those dates. We want to engage in a, in, a, in a series of workshops as often as we think is helpful to the community. And by workshops, I use that term loosely as, as Superintendent Wise is. We, we don't yet quite know what the needs are, what the hopes are, but this is an example. We know that there was a, a, quite a request from our community, quite, a, quite of a, a, an ask to, to know more about dyslexia, to learn more about dyslexia. What parts of dyslexia have to do with special ed? What parts don't? have to do with special ed. Where is the, the connection there? We very much would like to uh, become much more uh, transparent providers of that type of, of information to our community. And so this was a workshop that was planned to happen last May, I believe, last spring, uh, for, for many obvious reasons, uh, did not happen. So that might be uh, something that we'll plug into this first quarter. Um, uh, it, we're also open to other ideas and suggestions, and I'm hoping uh, some of these other options will give us some of the direction there. Uh, but, but definitely some things we're going to be um, putting on the, on the calendar. We've also arranged for monthly uh, parent advocate listening meetings. Our advocates out there are, are often really great vortexes of, of concerns and information that obviously they're gathering from uh, parents that are, are, are asking them to listen on their behalf or communicate on their behalf. And so we want to have purposeful, but really kind of open forum once a month. We're going we're gonna to sit and we're going to turn on our, our, our screen, our virtual, because we've got them all over parts of the, the front range area, and we're going to listen. And we're going to hear what it is that we need to hear from you and that we can be uh, better attending to. So that'll be a very open forum. Douglas County um, Kids Identified with Dyslexia, DC Kids, another uh, wonderful advocacy group with tremendous resources. Uh, meeting with them tomorrow morning, in fact. I'm, I'm on a virtual call with them tomorrow morning. Uh, tremendous uh, kind of re-engagement with them as, as they're really very, very committed to helping us uh, provide the best services and, and uh, uh, resources that we can to all of our kids. Uh, we're committed to, um, we're, we're, we're starting to put out plans for a, a monthly newsletter, a SPED newsletter. Um, you know, really the idea of the newsletter is more to be uh, highlighting some of the great work that's being done in our school, some of our great educators, some of the great uh, anecdotes, stories that just don't get told very often about what, what is happening for our, our community and our kids. Um, but also there was a wish, uh, uh, and this was uh, notified in, or uh, noticed and in, in surfaced in, a, uh, in the task force recommendations from a few years back that really more of a proactive communication vehicle for um, just educating our, our whole community. What are the services we provide? What are the uh, programs that are out there? What, are, what, are, what is eligibility all about? Just being more transparent and, and uh, proactive with, with communicating that information. And then uh, uh, both of my, uh, both of the, the special education directors are putting on their calendars, we'll, we'll get these dates out as soon as we have them, but we'd like to just do coffee talks, informal coffee talks. If, if you just want to show up here at uh, Wilcox or, or another location and you just want to just seek to understand, have a cup of coffee, ask questions, we also be happy to have our coordinators join in on those when they're available. Um, but, but again, just that idea of we want to enter into conversation and we really want to engage in, in dialogue. 
for example, ad hoc parent meetings and community groups. We've got, a, got a, a bunch of really wonderful parents out there that have just said, said, will you meet with us? And the answer is absolutely, happy to do that. If, as long as we're talking about kids, as long as we're talking about the work of, of uh, the tremendous special ed teachers in this district, I'll meet with any and everybody. So that's uh, on there and uh, just kind of as an ongoing reminder that that's, that's what authentic engagement is, is really all about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rundle. Next, we have Amanda Thompson, Chief Human Resource Officer, for our final slide. Yes, well, good compensation. evening. Good Pleasure evening. Pleasure to, to share an update with all of you and with our everyone watching and with our amazing employee groups on where we're at with our compensation project. So first of all, HR um, continues to uh, work quickly and diligently to work with our schools on hiring throughout the summer and also finalize any, any hires needed out there in the system. So we're really pleased to have been able to offer those services um, continually throughout the summer. At the same time, we have continued our compensation project work. I know that we have, um, this goes back to a couple school years. We're really excited to be able to share the plan this year. More, even more details in this coming. Uh, to be able to bring this to a close and a finalization. And so first of all, as we shared at the beginning of the presentation, it's so very important to continue to engage with, um, update our community, engage with our employees on what's happening, what steps we have to go, gather their input. We already have some wonderful venues in which we can do that. So with our employees, we're looking at engaging by employee groups. Um, with various uh, departments levels, district leader levels, sharing out here. Uh, we also have opportunity to share out um, through various communication protocols, such as um, our communications department puts out a lovely employee-focused newsletter, so we always have an HR corner in there. So there's a multitude of different ways in which we um, can share updates and, and provide input. We'll continue to plan as a group to really solidify what that looks like so that we can integrate those sessions um, into other employee sessions that we, we may be having and also into our community um, engagement schedule. First quarter began quickly and we are um, we've hired some new people. So the, since the last time that we have gathered um, educational data in since 2019, we know that we have wonderful educators out there that continue to grow um, as lifelong learners. So we want to, we will be doing a reach out out to our licensed employees to um, inquire if they have any other new educational attainment, and then we'll work to review that information and then confirm it with them. So we have the latest and greatest employee data available. Also, we need to ensure that we're con continuing to do that with our new hires as well. We also are um, almost complete with our market analysis for non-licensed employee groups. So when I say market analysis, that means how do we compare by every single job type? We have over 600 job types in our system job titles. How do we compare across the metro area to our neighbors? So we'll be able to produce information as, you know, how far below our comparators or above or close to at market are we to our neighbors? We look forward to, to sharing that with you. and. Um, one of our amazing retirees that continue to, we, we have a couple of those that help us out and that are their longstanding employees with us. Uh, Luann Heiler is working on doing that with us. So we're really pleased to have her support. We're also in the process of working with cabinet all the way down um, through each department and, and school level to review every job description to ensure that current responsibilities are updated. So as you can see, there, there's, there's layers to this and a culmination um, of our, our compensation project. So at that same time, uh, we're also develop, developing our plan for reviewing our non-licensed, knowing that um, we are very, very committed to continuing the work of revising um, teacher salary schedules. We're also doing that um, with our non-licensed employee groups as well. In fact, we've recently met with um, some of our, our friends in O&M, and we're gathering their feedback and um, having frequent meetings uh, to share with them of, of the progress and needs. In second quarter, um, after we update and review educational attainment, we'll take care of the, the systems alignment and things behind the scenes in HR. And we are revising and drafting a re, uh, employee license salary schedules. When we overlay the information here that we got in first quarter, we're overlaying it onto draft schedules that then we can not only share out with the system, 
and gather input, but we can also cost that as well, not only in short term, but in long term. Um, and then as I share, we are reviewing job descriptions for over 600 job types. So I look forward to coming to share with you again of and frequently of where we're at with our compensation project because again, we are very, very excited to continue in this work and to be able to accomplish this, this work worth doing. We're, we're very excited. Again, we'll be back here soon to um, share more of a, a concrete and detailed plan around community and staff engagement. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Very good, thank you. Thank you, cabinet members, um, for laying out our year. This is, really becomes our, our work that we have ahead of us and how wonderful it is to see the intentionality behind the engagement, the engagement of our parents, our staff. Um, it, it really, uh, I just wanna compliment you on the thoroughness of the plan that you've developed for us. I am gonna ask board directors that we hold our questions though because we're gonna hear about this a lot. This is not going to be the first or the um, not going to be the last time we hear about these topics. So I want us to hold our questions and just again, uh, we'll just take a moment to applaud all of you for the great work, the great presentation, the, all the information you've given to us today. <laughs> so next on our agenda is public comment. I'm sorry, Director Lung. Uh, well, I would like to move on to public comment as soon as possible, Director Lung. Is this? Okay, well, can it, is, is it a burning statement? Because we have people that are waiting to give us public comment tonight. Before that, I want to make a comment about the last. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, President Ray, for letting me to, uh, to make this comment because I think it's very important as um, your elected board director. Um, as one board director, I was there last Wednesday during. Um, the sections and a lot of TV broadcasts um, and the news is written about that. Uh, I think my main responsibility, except to the student, is to my staff. I want to say that the treatment to Superintendent Wise and Dr. Dallas last week, last Wednesday, is not acceptable. This agreement does not give you the right to disrespect. Just because you say that you're taxpayers does not give you the right to bully, disrespect, insult public sector employees. State of kindness should be treat people with respect. Truth does not belong to the one who shouts the loudest. Our kid learn by example. We will not let the kid to act this way towards others. Why are you doing this to Dorothy and Superintendent Wise? And I want to commend you know, our cabinet members there and Superintendent Wise for your excellent work last Wednesday. You showed the example of why you guys are belongs to leaderships. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Director Long. Next on our agenda is public comment. <clears throat> Two policies guide how public comment is received by the board. Board policy KE, public complaints, and board policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings. Policy BEDH states that comments be focused on policy matters and board policy KE outlines the appropriate channels of communication for a concern to be addressed prior to bringing it to the Board of Education. Public comment is placed prior to action items proposed on our agenda. Public comment is, is placed after our staff presentation so that public commenters can hear information that may be pertinent to the public comments. Those wanting to make public comment are requested to complete an online form prior to three o'clock of this meeting. Thanks to the ish, uh, see, sorry. Um, those who are signed up to provide public comment virtually, we also want you to remember the following. Once you've called in, your phone call will be muted until your name is called. Please make sure you're not running the meeting on a computer in the background and that you are in a quiet environment. Once I call your name, if you're calling in, please state your name and ask if you can be heard and I will respond for you to continue. The board would like all discourse that occurs in this room to occur in an atmosphere of mutual respect. Everyone in this room plays an important part in modeling appropriate behavior and promoting an environment that is fair, safe, and dignified. So to maintain the decorum and mutual respect, speakers are asked to refrain from using individual names in an offensive manner as this only distracts from the issue of concern. 
Applause, shouting, verbalizing during public comment compromises this decorum of respect. In order to make this a safe place for everyone, I would ask that no reaction be made after a comment is given, such as words or tones that may intimidate, condemn, or judge others. Helpful comments are always those that, provoke, that propose positive solutions and opportunities for working together. Please keep in mind that there, if there may be a need to interrupt if a board director calls for a point of order. If this occurs, comments should stop until directed to continue. Each speaker is allotted up to three minutes to address the board. You will hear a tone signaling the end of this time. Out of respect for the other commenters who have signed up tonight, please complete your comments within this three minute time. Due to the number of public commenters tonight, I will also ask speakers to stop immediately after you hear the signal at the end of the three minutes, again, out of respect to the other public commenters who are waiting. If you have handouts you, that you would like for us to have, please give those to Assistant Secretary uh, Sandy Marsh at the end of the dais, and she will distribute those to us. Please know that this is our time to just listen without engaging in discussion. However, your comments will certainly be considered as the board continues to do its work tonight. Please know that this is only one of many ways to communicate to the board. If you're seeking answers to a specific question or would like to have an interactive conversation, please consider emailing individual board directors and or contact Assistant Secretary Cindy Marsh to schedule a phone conversation. It's also important for our listening public to understand that public comments are not fact-checked, nor should the board's silence indicate agreement nor disagreement with what is being said. So with that, we will move on to public comment. I will call several names at one time so that all of you are ready to approach the podium. Our first public commenter is Peyton Gilstrap, followed by Krista Gilstrap, and then Julie Bateman. Peyton Gilstrap. Huh. She spoke like two meetings ago, so. Okay, well we must have it carry over. So Krista Gilstrap, you are up next, so go ahead. Thank you for that clarification. We actually had, we actually had her sign up and she said, please put me next to my mom. So that I think. That was two meetings ago. Was, okay. I just wanna make sure you have the right list. Okay, no we do. Okay, this is the third time I'm first and I really kinda hate that. <laughs> okay, okay, right. no, Peyton's not here. All okay. Right. Okay, I came here tonight to thank Mr. Weiss for standing by his plan to allow parents and students to make the big, best choice for their own health and safety. I'm sure this was not an easy decision, but I believe it was the right one. However, I was disappointed when I saw the email come through late Friday afternoon requiring our staff and teachers who aren't vaccinated to wear masks. What a slap in the face to these heroes who have been the backbone of getting our kids through this pandemic. They deserve to be treated like the highly educated professionals that they are and allow them to make the best decisions for their own health. We don't know why they haven't received the vaccine. It could be an underlying medical condition, religious belief, or countless other personal reasons that are no one's business. To call them out like this goes against your own policy of not shaming others. I've spoken to several teachers who are very upset by this last minute decision. They've said HR didn't even know about it before the email was sent. One reached out to me this afternoon privately on Facebook. I've never met them, but they knew I was speaking and a safe person to talk to. Their story is heartbreaking and has left them in a difficult situation of choosing, doing what's right for their own health or being there for their students. No teacher should ever have to make that choice. I ask you to reverse this policy. Lastly, I'd like to address the forum Mr. Wise held last week, and I wanna thank you for doing that, and I'm thankful you plan to continue to do so. What was very clear from that evening is the community desperately needs other avenues to feel heard by you all. I agree with Director Lung that I don't condone some of the behavior that happened that night. We need to be able to disagree and communicate with one another without treating each other with disrespect and unkindness. However, we cannot ignore the root cause of that behavior. What happened in that room was a direct response of this board and the trust that has been broken over the past year. I believe the feelings of anger, frustration, and betrayal that were directed towards you, Mr. Wise, were misplaced and should be directed towards this board. This community has failed our kids and our community, and we say no more. Most of the people in this room and who have spoke previously didn't know each other in January, but after suffering through one bad decision after another while being ignored when we told you what our kids needed has brought us together to tell you that we are done. 
We will not be steamrolled when it comes to what's best for our children anymore. God chose us to be the parents for our children and no one knows what they need more than we do. You've lost my trust and I'm afraid it's too late to get it back. That's why I'm joining the grassroots movement and supporting the Kids First DCSD candidates, Becky Myers, Mike Peterson, Kaylee Winnegar, and Christy Williams in the election this December. You can learn more about them at vote for the number four kidsfirst.com. And I ask all of you listening to please join us to help put people on this board that will put our kids first and restore trust, accountability, and transparency. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gilstrap. Julie Bateman is up next, then Carrie Beaumont and Laura Ferguson. Julie Bateman, good evening. Hello. Thanks for having me. Good evening. As a taxpayer, a teacher, and American, I take great pride in the public school system. Every child has a fundamental right to the best possible educational experience. Douglas County, we're not there yet, and I urge you to stay focused where we need the most work. Passing an equity policy is an important step, and I hope you adequately fulfill its promise. Many parents are concerned about this policy being implemented inappropriately, and so am I. And if you don't allow teachers the opportunity to be trained in this work, how can they be effective in implementing it? Your first attempt at teacher training was met with predictable parent pushback. Not teacher pushback, parent pushback. And at the first sign of a few angry parents, you canceled the contract with no immediate plan to find a new source of professional development. What kind of message is that sending to the community about your priorities with equity? Since many folks have quoted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., here's another quote from his famous I Have a Dream speech. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Douglas County, let's maintain the fierce urgency to address what isn't working for many of our students and families. When we look at the discrepancies in disaggregated iReady data that was presented at the last board meeting, I'm looking forward to actively analyzing why the math scores for black students are 46% on grade level compared to 68% for white students and addressing that. To correct a popular misconception, we do not need equal outcomes, we need equitable outcomes. The goal is not for every child to get the same score, but the growth and learning in any subgroup of kids should look similar to the growth and learning of any other subgroup of kids. I'm grateful that the first quarter plans to address these inequities. So that was, thank you for that. When you listen to all of our comments, I hope that you hear the voices of the folks who are fiercely advocating for our kids and for truth in education, even if the truth makes us uncomfortable. To the school board, to Superintendent Wise, I look forward to seeing this policy in action as we write the inequities and injustices in our school. Every day, we say we believe in liberty and justice for all. Where is the liberty and justice for our marginalized populations? I look forward to you following through with your promises with the fierce urgency that our kids deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bateman. Carrie Beaumont is next, Laura Ferguson, and then Krista Mann. Ms. Beaumont, good evening. Hi, and thank you. Um, I too have been a Douglas County resident, a taxpayer, a voter, and a parent. Um, I have three DCSD children, and I've lived in Douglas County for 20 years. I support the equity policy for many reasons. One very important reason for me personally is that it will make my children better, better people, and better scholars. Equity is not about teaching kids to feel bad, indoctrination, or to shame or place guilt. Equity in education means that personal or social circumstances, such as gender, ethnic origin, or family background are not obstacles to achieving educational potential and that all individuals reach at least a basic minimal level of skills. Truth in education is just teaching the stories of our country, all of the stories, not just the pretty ones. Yes, we already teach the good and there is much good in this country, but we learn and we become a more perfect union from the mistakes we have made. We cannot learn from those mistakes if we don't know about them. It's about inclusion, about a sense of belonging for everyone, everyone. It's vital that we learn about history and have discussions about what we want to keep and what we need to change. If we make a decision to not learn all our history, we keep ourselves unaware and we all lose. In Germany, schools teach about the Holocaust, not to place blame, but to learn from it. 
This equity effort is about inclusion and belonging no matter skin color, orientation, abilities, gender, status, everyone, and that is what all we all want for our children. Freedom of speech means hearing things you don't like, not silencing the truth because you don't like it. Please research, learn, ask questions, find answers, have discussions with those who have differing opinions, but do not assume, do not ignore, and do not make decisions based on rhetoric and ignorance of the facts. We need to increase student discussions around racial equity, and teachers need the academic freedom to hold these discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beaumont. Laura Ferguson is next, Krista Mann, and then Megan Birch. Laura Ferguson. Not seeing Laura, so we'll put a hold on there. Krista Mann, are you here? And Megan Birch, are you here? Very good. good, good evening. After Megan is Jillian Bangert, Kendra Apleton, and Latanya Brown. Good, good evening. evening. My name is Megan Birch, and I'm a Douglas County resident and parent to two DCSD students. I want to thank all of you directors, Superintendent Wise, for your time tonight. I also want to thank the BIPOC and LGBTQ students and parents who have previously shared their experiences at these meetings. I hear you, I see you, and I believe you. Before I begin, I want to cite the academic lineage of my statement, Thea Monier, Resma Menenkem, and Erin McCall. As a social worker and a parent, I want to thank the district for efforts to meet the mental health needs of our students. I want to emphasize that racism, homophobia, transphobia are detrimental to the mental health of all of our students, especially BIPOC and LGBTQ students. And I, I appreciate the district's recognition of this harm, and I want to express my support of DCSD's equity policy and efforts to create safe learning environments. Students must feel safe in their classrooms and in their nervous systems in order to learn. Additionally, in this year of 2021, it is no longer enough to simply provide opportunities for BIPOC and LGBTQ students to have a safe community or learn coping skills. We must also be actively dismantling oppression, racism, homophobia, transphobia. And one of the ways that we can do this is through education. Some of us adults in this room may have learned US history through the lens of the United Daughters of the Confederacy and their influence over curriculum published and then purchased by school districts all over the US. School curriculum in the US was influenced by folks with a desire to preserve Confederate memory. That is why some of us may have learned a history that was biased, erased BIPOC and LGBTQ folks, minimized the trauma of enslaved black people and genocide of indigenous people and at times was simply inaccurate. So in addition to voicing support today for DCSD's equity policy, I also want to voice my support for a more inclusive curriculum. I realize that DCSD has clearly stated that critical race theory is not being taught in the district. I want to voice my support of a critical learning framework with accurate and inclusive education being taught in the district. A framework that also celebrates BIPOC and LGBTQ creativity and innovation and to clarify a learning framework that examines the impact of oppression in this country isn't intended to shame, guilt, or create fear. It is designed to bring us together, to show up for each other, creating a beloved community as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had envisioned. The purpose of an inclusive and critical learning framework is to fulfill in action those words of liberty and justice for all, or as Austin Channing uh, Brown has said, to be a better human for other humans. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Birch. Uh, Jill Banghart is next. Kendra Appleton, Latanya Brown. Is Jillian Banghart here? She is remote. Ms. Marsh, did we have that? Okay. Ms. Banghart, can you hear me? Hello. Ms. Banghart? Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Jillian Banghart, and I'm a resident of Douglas County. I'm a mother of a 16-month-old who will eventually be a student in the Douglas County School District. I'm here today to speak in support of the equity policy. I strongly believe that it is our duty as human beings to acknowledge the ways that racism plays a role in our society. 
It is our duty to look at how racism plays a role here in Douglas County and to do whatever we can to change that. One example of this is the iReady data showing that non-white students are underperforming compared to white students in Douglas County. As non-white students are every bit as capable, intelligent, and driven as white students, this data clearly demonstrates that we have populations of students who are not being given the same opportunities to thrive in their educational environment. This is an example of why we need the equity policy to provide all students the same opportunity to succeed. As a taxpayer and voter, I would like to request that the school board make providing an all-inclusive education a priority for our students. I would like to request that Douglas County teachers receive diversity and inclusion trainings and that our current curriculum is reevaluated to ensure that all voices are being celebrated. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Banghart. Kendra Appleton is next, Latanya Brown and Tracy Dark. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here this evening as a parent to a DCSD student, a public school teacher and a resident uh, to be a voice in support of the equity work that you're doing. This evening, I want to encourage you to continue the equity work that's been started in DCSD. When it comes to equity, I've heard people say repeatedly now in this room that it's your job to yield to the parents speaking, but I want to just remind you, as I know that you know, it's actually your job to make the best possible decisions you can for the 63,000 plus students in this district, not just the ones represented in this space. Uh, public schools are not political pawns, religious institutions, or elite, elite clubs. And you must, as hard as it, as it is, seek to weed through this frenzy and make decisions that best serve every single kid, as I know is your heart. I want to thank you for approving this equity policy earlier this year. I thank you also for laying out your quarter one plans to continue this work. Um, I think these are long overdue steps in DCSD, and I really am excited to see them continue. Um, I hope that you do pr prioritize the following as you continue. Number one, consider how, when, and why you're making decisions that impact the equity of your students. I was really disheartened to hear um, in an article in the Parker Chronicle last week that the district, district equity trainings at the end of May were canceled at 12.37 a.m. the night after a particularly contentious board meeting. The district should weigh all decisions regarding students with a level head, um, many informed voices and much guidance, and not make knee-jerk decisions in response to politically fueled angry parental comments. Again, you must do what's best for all of your students. Number two, consider this disaggregated data we've been talking about um, on student growth and, growth and learning. Most recent CMAS data for DCSD showed achievement gaps for students with disabilities, English language learners, and those eligible for free and reduced lunch. And the iReady data that's been addressed a few times also shows gaps, uh, achievement gaps for black, black and African American students uh, compared to white students. What will the district's next steps be in closing these gaps? Three, consider how you're now going to provide meaningful and ongoing training to your teachers to help them be more equitable in and out of the classroom. Uh, the Gemini contract was terminated, and so now what will be the steps that we take, that you take, in order to make sure your te teachers have access to quality equity trainings? Number four, also please consider how your teachers feel comfortable being the experts that they are engaging in these discussions in their classrooms amidst such politically tumultuous times. As a public educator, I know that fear, and so how are you going to make sure that your teachers feel empowered and supported and what happens when they're not? Uh, and number five, consider your curriculum choices. Do all students see themselves represented in the books that they're reading, the voices that they're hearing, the content that's being taught? And when the answer is no, what's the district going to do to make sure that those things are um, alleviated and the, that we have a more equitable uh, curriculum for kids? Arthur, Arthur Chan once said, diversity is a fact, equity is a choice, inclusion is an action, and belonging is an outcome. You've chosen to prioritize equity, and I applaud you for that. What now are the next steps Douglas County Schools will take to ensure that all kids in the district feel as though they belong? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Appleton. Latanya Brown is next, Tracy Dark, and then Michael Nichols. Latanya Brown, are you here? Kate and Tracy Dark. Good evening. After Tracy's Michael Nichols and then Lois Everett. Good evening. Hi, I'm a family nurse practitioner in Centennial, Colorado, business owner of a medical practice since 2014 and mother of two. I am glad the Douglas County School Di District has decided to make masks optional for the children, but requiring the teachers to wear masks that are not vaccinated is not based on science. 
The coronavirus is aerosol and not droplet, which there's two big differences. I encourage you to go home, get a nicotine-free vapor, and smoke it through a mask. The smoke released is equivalent to aerosol. You will see the smoke goes through the mask, all around the mask, and without a problem, the smoke particles are actually larger than the COVID-19 particles. I have cited 47 studies proving that masks do not protect against coronavirus. I have proved that, provided them to the board members, and if anybody else would like an extra copy, please let me know. Dr. Fauci said at the beginning of the pandemic that face masks do not work against coronavirus. And if you read the label on a box of masks, it says in plain sight, it does not protect against coronavirus. The pore size of a cloth mask is 20 to 100 microns, and the size of a coronavirus is 0.1 microns, which is 200 to 1,000 times smaller, which is like a mosquito going through a chain link fence. Breathing is one of the most important physiological functions to sustain life. Health in human body requires continuous oxygen supply to all organs and cells for health to survive. I listed four studies below showing that wearing masks increase CO2 levels, which chronic hypoxemia leads to health deterioration, exacerbation, exacerbation of existing medical conditions, morbidity, and mortality. Not only is the lack of oxygen harmful, but while these coronaviruses are being filtered out of the mass, the bacteria and fungi are not. And so rebreathing these particles back in is harmful. A study done in Bangkok of 230 surgical masks showed isolated bacteria and fungi inside and outside of the mask, including Staphylococcus and Aspergillus. Also, a group of parents in Gainesville, Florida, cultured the mask of six children and included 11 dangerous pathogens, including Streptococcus pneumoniae, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Neisseria meningitis, and eight more, which can lead to conditions of pneumonia, tuberculosis, meningitis, sepsis, and death. Do you know that the National Institute of Health stated that during the influenza pandemic in 1918, most people did not die of the virus, but from the bacterial pneumonia as a result of mask wearing? I spoke to the Tri-County Health Department to try to find out what research they were using to implement a mask mandate, for which they told me to speak to the state epidemiologist. So when I spoke to the state epidemiologist, Rachel Hurley, she did not have or know of the research for face mask wearing. She wanted to walk me through the CDC website, which contains no credible peer-reviewed studies. I provided the board members with a relative size of particles that included coronavirus. And as you can see there, the red blood cells, which are not seen to the naked eye, are 7 to 8 microns. But the coronavirus is 0.1 microns. I feel like we are not only using, not using science for these mass requirements, but we are also not using common sense. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dark. <laughs> Audience. Mike Nichols is next. Audience, just remind, please, we don't want any reaction because that makes this not a safe place. I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. I am, I am just reminding all audience at this time that we would like to have no reaction after public comments, so this is a safe place for everyone. Mike Nichols, please go ahead. All right. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, today, uh, tonight, I would like to play the role of advocate for my uh, peers at the uh, DCSD Bridge Program. For those of you who don't, don't know what that is, um, that's, uh, that's, like an, that's like a school for uh, those with uh, those ages from 18 to 21, for those with special needs like myself. And um, tonight, specifically, um, I wanted to be like a voice for all of the, uh, the graduates who like, graduated in the classes of 2020 and 2021 and um, by that, I mean, I think that we should have like a real in-person graduation, you know? And the um, reason why I say that is because um, that's worked out in like years past, prior to uh, last year and this year. Because uh, in my case, um, last year we had a parade where the uh, teachers would come to all of our houses and kind of honk, which which I'll admit, um, it was a nice gesture and all that, but I don't know, it was, I'm gonna keep it real, um, it wasn't as good as the uh, graduation ceremonies like in person in the past over at Castle View High School, which is north of here. And so I actually have a date what I, when I like that to happen. And that date is Saturday, October 9th of this year at, over at Castle View High School, because I went to two Two of those graduations back in 2018 and 2019, and honestly, um, I, I would, I would, I would like, I would, uh, I would like nothing more than to have 
that experience of getting my high school diploma, you know, and um, I'm and I'm 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 thinking like, if any of the British or teachers or EAs or whatever are watching this, I'm gonna say this like, let's all work together, you know, like let's all work together. And yeah, but what I did here is that EAs or educational assistants have to be paid to be there at the graduation ceremonies. I'll tell all of you what, um, the uh, car motorcycle show that's hosted by the British Forum is next Saturday at the Highland Trance location. And if I see everyone there, um, I'll be willing to pay like $20 each to, yeah, to, uh, to get to, to pay, I, I don't care honestly, even if I have to pay every, pay every single one of them, that's fine with me. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, Lois Everett, again, audience. Lois Everett, Christina Courtney, and Kelly Dixon. Is Lois Everett here? See not, we have Christina Courtney who is remote. Christina Courtney, can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, Christina, please go ahead. My name is Christina Courtney. I live and teach in the district and wanted to take a second to share my thoughts on some items. To start, I wanted to state that the main theme in my building this year is finding your greatness. I am fortunate to work in a building where my administrators exude excellent kindness and empathy at all times. With that being said, I thought it would take a second to share some of the greatness our board members and upper administration display. Since this current board took office, there has been nothing but positive change. The board supports staff and students unequivocally they listen to all parties. They have worked hard to create a unified district instead of 91 different districts or schools. They are working with the district to support special education, curriculum alignment, and to create policy where equality is a priority. This board is often seen at schools, working with children, staff, and administration. In fact, I saw Kevin Lung on the first day of school at my building. These board members have also spent countless hours working to do what is right for children and staff in a pandemic doing what they can to ensure the safety for all. Several of our board members have jobs outside of their board duties and continue to work for staff and students tirelessly. As for upper administration, it is so wonderful to see people who have been in Douglas County for decades in roles at the upper level in cabinet. I appreciate Director Wise for being willing to speak openly to the public and am sorry for the way that they behaved and I'm thankful for some of the most recent changes he has made for staff, mask requirements for unvaccinated being one of them. He is one who has advocated for my building in the past and I will never forget that. I have to thank Matt Reynolds who took time out of his busy schedule last year to speak to my team about data. Katie Seawald and Nicole Ekman Trujillo, special education coordinators always make time for me whenever I have a question or anxiety about an eval or IEP. Dr. Tiffany Reagan is working around the clock to support schools and staff with learning about dyslexia. Lastly, my administration, Amy Moyle and Gail Hollins are always there for me personally and professionally. They are true models of what administrative leadership should look like. Other community members who model greatness on a regular basis are Kevin, De Kevin DePasquale and Callie Leba. They continue to advocate for students and staff and are eager to support <coughs> students and staff at all times. I'm thankful for them. One thing that is not great is some of the recent public behavior at board meetings and town halls. One of our DCSD students said at best, quote, I would just like to see more respect towards each other, end quote. I would like to remind you that our children are watching and you have to remember what example you are setting for them. And while I have my own opinions about masks and feel that they should be required for all, I'm not gonna be unkind or crude towards those who have differing opinions. We need to remember that in a world where you can be anything, be kind. I hope that those who are listening can reflect and identify their greatness or the greatness of others in their life. Thank you for all that you guys do. Thank you, Ms. Courtney. Kelly Dixon is also remote, then Jennifer Barnes and Jennifer Iverson. Kelly Dixon, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Ms. Dixon, please go ahead. Hello, thank you for your time. I'm a resident, parent, and taxpayer in Douglas County, and I want to speak about the equity policy. At the last meeting, the board reviewed the district's iReady data. This data showed achievement disparities along racial groups, namely that only 32% of the Hispanic and Latino population is performing at or above grade level expectations. 
It's only 22% for black or African-American students. That's compared to 45% in the district overall. I demand that the equity committee investigate what drove these outcomes. I demand that the district do a full equity audit to identify institutional practices that are producing trends of discrimination towards students of color. I also want to see a full audit of student handbooks or codes of conduct to identify which policies are perpetuating racial harm. Additionally, the district should track and report on disciplinary, disciplinary actions by race. I hope some of this analysis, uh, some of the analysis mentioned earlier is considering, is considering these aspects. Furthermore, the iReady data showed that the population of the district is only 28% students of color, with only 1% of the population identified as black or African-American, and only 14% of the population identifying as Hispanic or Latino. I demand that the equity committee investigate and report on why this district is so white, or if you want something more specific, what teacher training exists or is being added on how best to support underserved populations? What specific efforts are being made to increase teacher diversity within DCSD? How is the district now, or how are you planning to build genuine partnerships with parents of color? Have you considered this in your plans for roundtables? Do our libraries and curricula have a wide selection of children's books and other literature that authentically connects to the cultural, historical, and lived experiences of Black, Indigenous, Asian Pacific Islander, and Latinx folks? One other thing I would like to note, the foundation for Douglas County Schools, which provides grants and funds PTO chapters, sports team boosters, and clubs, has many corporate sponsors. At least two of them have achieved a human rights campaign corporate quality index of 100, the maximum possible and at least one was listed as one of Forbes' best employers for diversity this year. Here's what some of them have, have to say about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Lockheed Martin CEO, Jim Takelet, in a 2020 Global Diversity and Inclusion Year in Review, quote, for a global technology company like Lockheed Martin, striving to maintain a diverse workforce and an inclusive work environment is not only the right thing to do, it is also a business imperative. Ryan Craig, Chief Talent Officer for United Healthcare, quote, the 2021 CEI rating underscores United Health Group's commitment to promoting an equitable and diverse environment that reflects our steadfast values, especially during these challenging times. Now more than ever, strengthening the sense of community among our LGBTQ plus employees and allies, allies not only helps us attract and retain top talent, but also makes our company stronger. Is Douglas County's equity work aligned with the values of these corporations that are supporting us? What would their position be on the equity initi initiatives of the district? We have an equity policy. We've been briefed on a high-level plan. We are going to hold the district accountable for data-driven, concrete, real improvements into equity in our schools. Equity is the priority. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Jennifer Barnes is next, Jennifer Iverson, and then Kendra Neasel Stewen. Jennifer Barnes, good evening. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm a resident of Parker with a 10th grader who has been in Douglas County Schools since kindergarten. I'm a school nurse, a US Army veteran, and I'm a Douglas County taxpayer. And I wanna say first, um, Superintendent, I was appalled by the, how you were treated last week, and I, um, I know that all of you guys' jobs are really hard, so I just wanna say um, there's some of us out here that really know that you're working very hard, and I want you to know that. I also wanna thank the board for approving the equity policy last year. Um, this step is, an, is essential to ensuring all students at Douglas County get an education that allows for them to reach and maximize their full potential. The outrage that I have witnessed at the board meetings against the equity policy from my fellow community members is confusing. The US Department of Education reports the equity policies lead to several advantages for our students. This includes increasing the amount of students that are college and career ready. It increases access to higher quality preschool and higher education to all families within the community. Equity policies lead to higher graduation rates and lower dropout rates. And ultimately these outcomes result in improving our local community financially and with positive growth. If the equity policy is implemented effectively, many students will benefit from it. This includes racial minority students, students from low-income families, families with language barriers, students from LGBTQIA plus communities, students with medical diagnoses including diabetes, ADHD, PTSD, or dyslexia, students enrolled in special education, and students with disabilities. And this is not an inclusive list. If you're questioning that these dis dis disparities exist, I will point you to the superintendent's iReady report that shows an educational disparity among our black and African-American students from last year. 
To ensure the equity policy has been has the intended incomes, it's necessary for further actions. And it's very clear that you guys have those steps in place, and I'm really happy to hear that. I would just request that you also um, you know, make sure that the community knows what those disparities are so they understand what you guys are addressing. I also hope that you will take the perspective of the underserved students and ask how you can make them feel safe to maximize their potential, own potential in the building. And finally, I ask that you bravely counter the minority of people who are speaking out against all of our children receiving an equitable education. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Jennifer Iverson is next, Kendra Neiselstuen, and then Brandy Bradley. Ms. Iverson. Good evening, board. Good evening. There are a couple of topics I'd like to address this evening. But first, thank you for posting the agenda um, a few days before this meeting so that people can review the topics that were discussed. It's an excellent modeling for best practices of any special education department to send parents the draft of their students' IEP and 504 a few days before the meeting so they can better understand and be participants. Right. A presentation from our new safety and security director, John Grusing, made me think. As an ardent advocate for students with visible and invisible disabilities, I urge Mr. Grusing to include in, the training, in your training specific and explicit directions for all security staff on the best practices of interacting with this population. Often many of the criteria within a threat assessment include behavior characteristics characteristics of students who receive special education services. Our community would welcome a parent engagement to hear and discuss details about this training. Gratefully, parent engagement proposals were also on this evening's agenda. I'm excited to see so many opportunities for people to have conversations that connect them and help them learn about what DCSD offers and will be implemented by each principal and staff member. I am hopeful that these efforts to repair relations with the special education community result in positive, effective changes in climate, culture, equity, and execution in DCSD and not, other and not another checked box. Lastly, I wanted to address a very pressing issue involving our community. A friend and I were comparing a previous time that our country clashed with opposing thoughts. In 1985, states began pushing for progressive legislation that required seat belts to be worn for our safety. My grandparents and some other family members were adamant that they would never wear a death trap of a contraption called a seat belt. One uncle even wore a t-shirt depicting a seat belt to fool police officers. Today, 88% of Coloradans wear their seat belts. I wear my seat belt every time I drive my car. I haven't had an accident in many years, yet when I see a reckless driver, I feel better for having it on. I know several families battling cancer. I know and personally experience a compromised immune system. I wear my mask like I wear my seatbelt to protect the ones I love and every person in my community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Iverson. Kendra Neiselstuen, Brandy Bradley, and then Julie Lamb. And Kendra, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your last name. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Am I getting close? It's close. It's Neil Sestuen. Neil Sestuen. But very close. Okay. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Thank you for your time. I am a taxpayer, a voter, a concerned community member, and a parent. I have been a Douglas County resident for 18 years. I am the parent of two children. Uh, a young adult and a teen. I have a child in the LGBTQ plus community and the autistic community. I also have another child who is dyslexic and in the learning disability community. They have lived the entirety of their lives in Douglas County. I myself am a bisexual woman who is a teen living in Colorado when our state passed an amendment so anti-LGBTQ, it earned us the name the hate state. In that regard, I know what it's like to be a child in an environment that is unsupportive and even hostile toward who you are. Coordinating being here is not easily done with my schedule. However, I felt compelled to speak before you tonight to discuss educational equity, inclusive excellence, and it's important to our community. 
This week, I read an article titled Backlash Stalled Douglas County School District Equity Plans, followed by contract with consultants came to an abrupt end. According to the article and a quote from a district spokesperson, DCSD is slowing down and regrouping on the issue. Uh, when, according to the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, using federal data, research in over 96,000 schools and 32 million students shows black students are subject to disciplinary, disciplinary actions much higher than that of their white counterparts, creating higher risk for negative light, life outcomes, including involvement in the criminal justice system, we cannot slow down. When according to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, lesbian, gay, and bisexual high school students are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers, and 40% of transgender adults have attempted suicide, a disproportionately high number compared to the general population, I implore you not to slow down. My speaking time is limited, and these are only a couple of examples, but there are numerous ones to mention. We can only truly care about mental health for children if we care about those most impacted. We have to care about equity, too. There's no time to slow down. Children needed us yesterday and long before. And since we failed them there, the best we can give them is now. Let's at least give them that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Mendelson. Brandley Bradley is next, Julie Lamb, and Mike Peterson. Brandy Bradley, are you here? Julie Lamb, are you here? Oh, sorry, thank you. Brand oh, Brandy, are you there? I'm here. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Hi. First of all, I wanted to thank everyone and anyone involved who got our kids back into in-person learning with the option of a mask. Corey, thank you for listening to us and for making an independent decision regarding Douglas County. And I also, again, wanted to thank you for canceling the Gemini group training. After consulting with our Douglas County commissioners and learning that Douglas County School District is an independent governing body that sets its own policies for schools, it's nice to see our district not in agreement with the mask mandate that Tri-County wanted to push. I will say I'm disappointed that we are shaming unvaccinated teachers into masking, and it goes against your own policy about not shaming. A double-blind study from Stanford University published in the National Center for Biotechnological Information, a branch of the NIH, found that the physical properties of medical and non-medical face masks are ineffective at blocking SARS-CoV-19 particles. Whether you want to disregard the study or not, what it does tell us is that COVID-19 particles have a diameter of 60 to 140 nanometers while face mask thread diameter is ranged from 55 to 440 micrometers, which is a thousand times larger than the virus particles. The study also showed that efficiency of filtration rate is 0.7% in non-surgical cotton gauze masks, 26% in cotton sweeter material, and only 15 to 58% in N95 and surgical medical masks. The data from the study suggests that medical and non-medical face masks are ineffective to block human-to-human -human transmission of viral and infectious diseases like COVID-19. Although some studies have concluded that wearing face masks have been demonstrated to have substantial adverse psychological and physiological effects such as hypoxia, shortness of breath, rise in stress hormones, headaches, anxiety, and depression. Proof that kids and teachers should not be in masks, especially if we are following the science. About the vaccine, the WHO still does not advise anyone 18 and younger to get it, and it's still under FDA emergency use. In fact, the CDC has an ongoing study of teens who are getting myocarditis after vaccinating. If you're vaccinated, I'm trying to understand why you're so worried about those of us that are unvaccinated. I know some of you on the board are pro-choice. We preach my body, my choice. We preach it about fluidity. We preach it about gender neutrality. But now we're, we're asking people to not have that choice. And we're asking people who don't feel like vaccinating that we should vaccinate. And we're trying to bully and shame them. Today, my son's Spanish teacher went around the room asking who was vaccinated. This is a private matter and not up for discussion. And quite honestly, none of her business. Vaccinations are an individual decision. They should not be mandated in order to go to school or play sports. They should not be government mandated. And we should stop stripping away our freedoms of choice. Lastly, I'm very disturbed that both my freshman and seventh grader experienced different teachers asking them about their pronoun usage. I think this should be a private discussion or email exchange and we should not be taking up classroom time. Do we take time to talk about the fact that my kids being taught by his parents only believe in two genders? 
Thank you. All right, Ms. Brand thank Bradley, you thank all. you very much for your comment. Julie Lamb, Michael Peterson, and Erica Hancart. Is Julie Lamb here, or is she on remote? No? Not remote, okay. Mike Peterson is next, then Erica Hancart and Crystal Ruddy. Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I've learned in all my time in leadership is the best way to take care of your mission is to take care of your people. So one of the things we can do is take care of those taxpayers. And I think we can do that best by having solid fiscal oversight. So I recommend we listen to our committees and thank them for their service, especially the Long Range Planning Committee and the uh, Mill Bond Oversight Committee. Make sure we give them the data and the guidance to do their job and help you. Uh, when you run a bond, stick to the stated priorities and communicate those a little bit better to the taxpayer. And if you ask for a mill levy override for the teachers, give them the money first and then go on to other priorities. Taking care of our students, we can do that by putting education first. This year, and thank you to Superintendent Wise and the rest of the cabinet, should prioritize academic recovery, growth and achievement, supported by the critical elements of school safety and mental health. And I think you're doing that, but let's minimize the other distractions. I'd also like to really thank Rich Payne for all his service and what he's done around school safety. Treat the kids as individuals, not identity groups, and help each student achieve their own unique potential. Don't pursue these equal outcomes because we know in the end, our kids will not be equal. Their success of readiness for the future is the whole reason this entire district exists. And I would uh, suggest you measure that success or your success by their success. Take care of our parents through communication and respect, and that's a two-way street, so thank you for being so gracious the other day, uh, Superintendent Wise. But acknowledge those parents as the experts on their kids. Make it easier for them to understand what is being taught in the classroom and why. We have to increase that transparency. And then finally, respect them by taking actions on their concerns. Take care of our teachers through increased trust and increased local discretion. Take the bureaucracy and political agendas on both sides out of the curriculum and take the administrative burdens off their plate. Trust them to do their jobs and I know they'll do it incredibly well. Close the pay gaps with surrounding districts, improve the internal culture, and then finally, on the role of masking, um, whether you agree or disagree with the policy, don't give them a policy at the last minute on a Friday before the first day of school. Give them the same time to consider and the same choice the teachers have. In my time remaining, I'll suggest two things that we can do right now as a board to help our, our students and our teachers and advocate for our people. First, take a look at uh, policy EBBA, the one on infectious transmission, and just change it from deferring to Tri-County and Colorado Public Health, because it says we will follow their guidelines, and change it to consult with. Put the power back in your hands, put it back in the superintendent's hands, and give the parents the predictability and stability they want. And then finally, put mask enforcement explicitly in the hands of those principals. They know their teachers, they know their students best, and they can make those considered decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Erica Hancart, Crystal Ruddy, Amity Wicks. Erica Hancart, good evening. Good evening, my name is Erica Hencard. I'm a parent in the district and a former middle school teacher. First, a quote from Dr. Benjamin Rush, MD, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Unless we put medical freedom into the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize an undercover dictatorship to restrict the art of healing to one class of men and deny equal privilege to others will be to constitute the Bastille of medical science. All such laws are un-American and despotic and have no place in a republic. The constitution of this republic should make special privilege for medical freedom as well as religious freedom. I wish we had listened. Medical autonomy should never be dependent on outside factors or need to be earned by qualified behavior. I would like to address the quarantine now called isolation recommendations. Students and staff who are sick should stay home. The education of our students is being held hostage by unelected officials who are using the PCR test as a bargaining chip as they determine who is worthy of being in school. The PCR or polymerase chain reaction nasal swab tests are unreliable at best and a fraudulent power grab at worst. I would like to add the following to the public record. 
Number one, on July 13th, 2020, the CDC released a statement that PCR tests, quote, may not necessarily indicate the presence of an infectious virus, may not prove that a SARS-CoV-2 fragment is the cause of clinical symptoms, and cannot rule out disease caused by other bacterial or viral pathogens. Number two, on July 21st, 2021, the CDC issued a laboratory alert the quote, CDC encourages laboratories to consider adoption of a multiplexed method that can facilitate detection and differentiation of SARS-CoV-2 and influenza viruses. Number three, CDPHE has $173 million of federal funding designated for testing programs in schools across the state. Besides massive testing, CDPHE plans to, quote, set up a reward program so students who participate can get a gift card for every week they are tested. This is medical coercion. We will not tolerate discrimination, segregation, psychological trauma, or preferential treatment based on personal medical choices. It is not possible to live in a world where no one ever gets sick. It is possible with your leadership to live in a world where you, our elected officials, don't use health agencies to invade privacy and track illnesses, but rather work to protect the privacy and the education of our children. Thank you, Ms. Hancock. Um, we are gonna take a 10 minute break. It's at 8.30, but when we return, we will reconvene public comment with Crystal Ruddy, Amity Wicks, and Elizabeth Stokely. 10 minutes board.
Okay, the board will reconvene. We are in the middle of public comment. Next person is Crystal Ruddy, Amity Wicks, and then Elizabeth Stokely. Is Crystal Ruddy here? There she is, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Crystal Ruddy. I'm the mother of a fourth and second grader here in Douglas County. First, I'd like to thank Mr. Weiss. I don't know where, where he is. There He's he is. coming. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to thank Mr. Weiss for hosting the town forum last week. While I feel we have room to improve on these meetings, they are vital to our community finding solutions and voices being heard. I would also like to thank Mr. Weiss for giving parents a choice when returning our children to school this week. I am certain there are many pressures from all sides making your job nearly impossible. Thank you to the DCSD staff for leading us through the challenges of the past 18 months. Because of your ongoing efforts, hand washing and sanitation have never been stronger in our schools. But now is the time to acknowledge that COVID-19 cannot continue to be approached in one dimension. This is not a one size fits all situation. That mental health, education and social interaction once mu must once again be weighed more heavily in our decision making processes. It is time to allow individuals the freedom to assess the risk and find the solution that best fits their goals. Nearly every article or published study shows that children are low risk to COVID-19, but I have heard many state they would like to see no risk. Since when do we operate in a no risk environment? We all consider risks each day and weigh them up against cost, social effects, and other factors. When any one dimension becomes absolute, we become un unbalanced in our decision-making process. We need our kids to see that we can make choices and respect the choices of our neighbors, teachers, and fellow community members. I've had conversations with other parents who plan to or already have pulled their students from Douglas County. I will not do this. We purchased a home and have rooted ourselves in this community and district and will not see it fail. I will, however, work alongside of you and any board that follows to ensure the students of Douglas County get access to the teachers, schools, principles and experiences they were promised. I will be here every step of the way, holding you all accountable to do what is best for the whole student, not just the test scores, but for the student's mental, emotional, and physical well-being. If we want to get past COVID, we need to go through COVID together in a harmonious and respectful manner. And that starts with giving parents and teachers the choice to assess their own risk and holding true to your word. The email that was released late Friday regarding unvaccinated teachers wearing masks is a fine example of you not holding true to your word. Please help me and others like me trust you again. Please help my daughters trust you. The emotion exhibited last Wednesday at the town hall was rooted in a lack of trust. Perhaps if you, the elected officials of this community, can consider multiple dimensions in order to make wise decision, this community again can again trust in those decisions. Please protect what Douglas County School District is, was, can be, and needs to be going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reddy. Amity Wicks is next, Elizabeth Stokely, and then Gwyn Spawn. Amity Wicks, good evening. Hello, my name is Amity Wicks. In June, I stood here having provided a myriad of articles showing the terrible effects that the measures taken by our governing bodies have had on our youth. I also shared articles showing the dangers of mask wearing. Well, I know that our current plan offers freedom to choose. You might understand my skepticism about that when you mandated the, that student facing faculty and staff who are unvaccinated wear masks on a Friday before school starts. This amounts to medical discrimination, especially since we know that the vaccination doesn't, does not prevent transmission of COVID-19 and may even contribute to higher rates of transmission due to viral shedding after receiving the vaccine. Breakthrough is now an actual term because there have been so many people who have contracted COVID after receiving the vaccine. Many have been hospitalized and or died despite the promise of how safe and effective the, the claims. And now we are hearing that a booster will be needed. Wouldn't the very nature of a booster being needed, especially soon after, so soon after the original was given, negate the claim of effectiveness? Another reason for my skepticism about the claim that the goal is so-called health is that there is no talk of complete health by any of those making decisions. Why are you not putting out suggestions about eating a pesticide-free organic diet of fruits, vegetables, and naturally sourced meats, etc.? the avoidance of sugar and processed foods, a point I will revisit momentarily. Why is there no talk of regular exercise or regular and adequate sleep schedules, vitamins and supplements, specifically vitamin D, a deficit that has been shown to play a large part in severe COVID cases, among other ailments? The list goes on and on about things we could encourage for complete health besides hand washing, masks, and injection of chemicals into our systems, but we never hear about those things. 
Now let me revisit processed foods, specifically as it relates to district provided free free lunches. I went exactly one time to pick up a free bag lunch for my kids. There was one apple in each bag that I kept out of a whole week's worth of lunches. The rest was absolute junk. Every other item was full of sugar, super processed starches and carbs, and nothing I would consider remotely healthy. It was basically a bag full of gut bombing immunity system sabotage. Do not even begin to tell me that we are about health when actively providing consumables, I can't even in good conscience call it food, that we know contribute to all kinds of illness and suppress the immune system. For almost 18 months, we've existed in a world I never thought we would see. People came, mili became militant about masks, despite even Fauci saying that cloth masks are ineffective. Our world has become one in which fear seems to be held up as an idol and a virtue. We have been teaching our children to see people as walking contagions, not as thinking, feeling individuals, but only as a part of a collective mass. In attempts to achieve safety, we saw our children suffer tremendously. We've seen the numbers, you've seen the numbers of suicides, the mental health crisis that has been created by these terrible policies that put up literal and figurative barriers to re relational connection, a part of human being, hu being human that is just as essential to health as breathing. Are you struggle enough with identity, social cues, making significant interpersonal connections? And then we went and basically erased facial expressions. And the main thing that identifies them is unique individuals, their very faces. Take out your driver's license. What is the way that you are identified so that you can prove who you are? Your face, not just your forehead with a mop of hair, not two ears, not your forearm, your face. Our children's faces were taken from them for okay. a whole year. Thank you, Ms. Wicks. Elizabeth Stokely is next, Gwen Spawn, and then Nicole Mosley. Elizabeth Stokely, good evening. Hi there. Hi, my name's Ellie, and I am a resident of Highlands Ranch. And I'm a mother to four boys, three of which go to Redstone Elementary right in Highlands Ranch. And I've stayed very quiet this last year and watched what's happened in our schools. I never felt or never thought I would come to a board meeting to speak, ever. But I feel compelled to be here to represent the feelings of my family and so many more that feel like we do. It's been a terrible year for so many people. My husband and I chose to do the e-learning option last year, and it was amazing, but it was also very difficult. I have four children. <laughs> So after that year, we had the best teachers ever, but we've decided to come back to school. And I never ever thought in my entire life that sending my children to a public school would give me anxiety. If you watch the media, you watch the social media, it's like it's a war zone in those schools. Well, I went to the Meet the Teacher night, and it was not a war zone. There was people wearing masks, there was people not wearing masks, and the parents were just fine, and so were the kids. My kids came home from their first day of school yesterday, and I asked them, how did it go? Were kids wearing masks? Yes. Was it a big deal? No, Mom. Literally, we don't care. I said, you're not wearing a mask. Were people upset with you? Did anyone say anything to you? No, Mom. Oh, my gosh. We just don't care. <laughs> so these kids are able to handle it. And I think from, from the nights and the days that I've been at the school, so were the parents. This is not as big of a deal. We don't need to be out for blood after each other. I, wanna, I want to thank all of you for giving the parents the right to choose. We spend our entire lives making the tough choices for our children, making those decisions that can alter their lives forever. And I think we know the best way to move forward with our children as individuals. And I know that you as a board have to look out for thousands and thousands of students, but I think we need to remember as a group that each of those children is an individual. They have very specific needs and very individualistic needs. And I think we'll be better off if the parents that know those children the best can make the best choice for them. So please don't mandate masks and please don't mandate vaccines for our kids. Let us parents have the final choice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Noakley. Gwen Spahn is next, Nicole Mosley, and then Jessica Joy. Ms. Spahn, good evening. Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for allowing us to choose whether or not our kids go to school in a mask. And I'd like to continue to have that choice and allow all teachers and staff to have that choice as well. Unfortunately, requiring unvaccinated teachers to wear masks is very backwards for numerous reasons. First of all, we, we know the vaccine does not decrease transmissibility of the virus. Secondly, we know that people can choose to get the vaccine because it can decrease the severity of symptoms, which can be life-threatening for some at-risk groups. And I'm grateful for people to have that choice, but again, the vaccine does not decrease transmissibility of the virus. So those that are vaccinated have more mild symptoms, allowing them to still go to work or go to school. Whereas those who are unvaccinated may have greater symptoms requiring them to stay home or rest. So the vaccinated become those that are more likely to spread the virus and pose a larger risk to others. So why don't we all wear masks? Because the masks are ineffective. The CDC says masks are ineffective to protect against wildland fire smoke particulates that we can see 
due to their small size, yet masks are effective at keeping us safe from a virus. But smoke particulates can be 1,000 to 2,500 nanometers in size, whereas coronaviruses are 80 to 120 nanometers in size. So a 1,000 nanometer smoke particulate cannot be stopped by a cloth mask, per CDC, but a 100 nanometer virus molecule can. Some say that masks are effective because they stop droplets from getting out. So let's touch on that. So we keep droplets from escaping cloth masks, but the viruses are still able to get through. Left in our children and our teachers' masks are the droplets that cause a, cause a moist environment that they are breathing in and having on their faces all day long. Does anybody know anyone who has gotten rashes on their faces, increases in acne, or like my son, bacterial pneumonia? My son, as a kindergartner last year, got bacterial pneumonia four times last semester. His pulmonary doctor warned us that masks are ineffective at blocking the virus, but are very effective at trapping bacteria when worn all day long. People need to be able to choose what is best for themselves and for their children. Please do not let the vaccine be mandated for our children. Kids are more at risk for an adverse reaction from this vaccine, which is not even past animal trials yet, than they are from complications from this virus. The reason being the high levels of glutathione naturally present in kids. Glutathione is the most important cellular defense that allows the body to prevent and fight infections and disease. It plays crucial roles in the immune response, DNA repair, and the detoxification process of chemicals, radiation, carcinogens, bacteria, and viruses. It's like sticky flypaper. Whatever glutathione attaches itself to, and it cannot escape, and it is removed from the body. It is our body's natural scavenger that gets rid of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. It also boosts white, cell blood, or white blood cell production to help fight infection. It is so prevalent in kids through pu puberty that they can more easily fight off the virus than they can the adverse reactions from this vaccine. In closing, instead of continuing to debate the mandatory mask and vaccine, People should have the choice on how best to protect themselves, and we should be coming together to focus on our children's mental health. We need to work together to decrease the rise we've seen in substance abuse, Thank mental you, health Spahn. issues, and suicides. Those are greater threats okay, to our kids across the district than this virus. Thank you, Ms. Spahn. Thank you. Nick, Nick Cole, Mosley, I believe you are remote, Jessica Joy, and then Constantine Kokolis. Nicole Mosley, are you there? Yes. Yes, Ms. Mosley, please go ahead. I am also a parent of two kids in high school and one in elementary, and I seem to be on the opposite spectrum as everyone else I've heard this evening on masking. Um, my daughter is in elementary school and is uneligible for a vaccination at this time, and I feel that it is irresponsible of the board to take the CDC's advice versus masking so lightly it literally says, due to the circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, CDC recommends universal indoor masking by all students ages two and older, staff, teachers, and visitors to K-12 schools, regardless of vaccination status. I would say that my boys are vaccinated and they are still masking at school. We have had no illnesses and we have um, been keeping everybody safe at home and not risking anything that is unmasked. And I feel like sending my daughter to school, even in her N95s, is not effective because it's only protecting other people, not necessarily herself. I would really implore you people to make a decision on what's best for the children and not what's best for the parents or public opinion at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. Jessica Joy is next, and then Constantine Kokolis, and then Lisa Mason. Jessica Joy, good evening. Yes. Thank you, um, President Ray and board members. My name is Jessica Joy. I'm a pornography industry survivor. I have pornography legislation in 36 states. 17 states have, have passed a resolution to protect children from pornography. Not that we needed a resolution to know obscenity is not protected speech. I attended the nation's top sex trafficking recovery with a 95% success rate of girls not returning to exploitation. We didn't have the victimhood Olympics every morning at 7.30. Uh, yes, we failed forward on a daily basis. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> imagine my surprise after I've, I know everything about force and fraud and coercion. I've seen girls trafficked by her government to go through my program and see that 
I'm going to be trafficked by my government for political and financial gain on this side. I was like, <laughs> no thanks. I saw the grooming of children when, uh, when they arrived to the porn sets. They were porn set ready. I saw that sexuality was their only value. Uh, I've seen the sexualization of children and what it leads to. I've, I've seen what exploitation results in. Imagine my surprise that it's within textbooks. There's three things that every parent should know. <sighs> First of all, this is, um, this is obscenity. Uh, we do have current obscenity codes, and you can change obscenity codes through your sheriff's department. We can have a little conference with our sheriff and start filing criminal charges. It'll be awesome. Okay, so number one, parents, you have to know that there's obscenity laws, and you can amend them locally. I was on a documentary uh, this week, Whose Child Are They? And I'm like, I think, Mr. Sheriff's Department, we have to establish the jurisdiction because I've also studied where laws come from, and everything that we sat through the hour prior to uh, public comment belongs to the United Nations. I have, I'm just Kajoi on YouTube. I just, I just dumped hundreds of videos from the United Nations online. So I think we have to um, open an investigation of what jurisdiction are we under? Do children have sexual rights? Because according to the United Nations, we're always gonna be going around on this subject. Um, so we need to establish, do our kids belong to the United Nations or do they belong to us as our biological property? Uh, next, and then, Next and final, the third thing that parents must know is we, there is a local solution. Uh, drag Queen Story Hour lawsuits, that, that's ours. We do litigation, we do legislation. We never stop protecting children, which I heard we all have in common. As I toured a, a recovery home, uh, one girl was, I said, what was your biggest breakthrough? And she said, when I realized that most parents don't sexualize their children, I pray to return to a day that we don't normalize the sexualizing of our children. And I want to say thank you to the Sheriff's Department. And thank, thank you, you for Ms. your Joy. time. All right, very good, thank you. Constantine Kokolis is next, Lisa Mason, and then Susie Kuntz. Um, Ms. Constantine, sorry, my apologies, Constantine Kokolis. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that last name correctly. It's close enough. Doesn't All right. It's <laughs> Thank a hard you. name. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, today I'd like to talk about what Children's Hospital of Colorado and many other healthcare and child psychology organizations have called a mental health emergency for children. Last time I spoke to this board, I talked about the numbers of children who committed or tried to commit suicide in the state and in this county. I talked about the need for training and tools for teachers, parents, and students how we all could work together to stop this epidemic. Most of my comments mirrored a very insightful student advisory group who said similar things. As this school year opened, I saw on a DS, you know, DCSD email something about suicide prevention, mental health, and SEL. I had no idea what SEL was, so I went on to your website. There I found the health prevention and SEL team and learned that social emotional learning is a lens, not just a bag of tricks and tools and curricula to teach. That lens starts with us. I thought, well, that's interesting. Most experts, including the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, think there are tools that can be used to prevent suicide. But I read on uh, to the what is this section, I saw a very long statement that gave no details on how SEL is gonna help children with mental health emergencies. And I also saw some references to the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, CASEL framework being used. So I went on to research SEL and CASEL group to see what they have to say. Within minutes, the truth began to reveal itself. There's a highly watched June 2020 webinar entitled SEL as a Lever for Equity and Social Justice. Castle's very own CEO, Karen Niemi, leads it. Summarizing what I saw, Niemi and her colleagues proclaim that SEL is a tool for anti-racism and should be used to elevate favored students based primarily on race over disfavored students. They say that a colorblind approach ignores the humanity of the people you're interacting with and doing so makes us reproductive of the inequities that we are experiencing in our schools, communities, healthcare, et cetera. In December, the president and CEO of CASEL, Karen Nemi, announced that CASEL has revised its definition and revised the framework for socio-emotional learning to highlight the value of SEL as a weapon for social justice and emphasizes student identities, marginalization, equity, just communities, the collective over the individual. I also have been reading that parents across the country have been blindsided by this SEL, which is being used to cultivate not any knowledge, but of the correct attitudes, beliefs, opinions, and behaviors children should have. First question, what is this? This is not suicide prevention. 
is this your second attempt at bringing CRT back into the district? And second of all, how dare you? How dare any of you say that suicide prevention, suicide in our kids, should be some sort of masking tape to hide SEL? SEL is not what we need in this county, in this district. We need to save these kids who are having these thoughts about suicide. We need to do it right and make it a priority. I'm telling you right now, if this is some sort of political ideology that this group is, is trying to betray for themselves, if you want to just go along with the teachers union and put kids second in your political beliefs first, then come November, not many of you are going to be sitting up there anymore. Thanks. Thank you, sir. All right, Lisa Mason, Su Susie Kuntz, and Greg Gilbert. Lisa Mason, good evening. Hi, good evening. Members of the board and Mr. Wise, I'm here to advocate for continued teacher and student choice for vaccination and masks. I wasn't able to attend the forum last week, but I did watch it live. While I did feel bad for you, I also saw many parents who were out of character because they feel ignored. Every meeting or email you mention your partnership with the CDC and Tri-County Health as if it's something to be proud of. When the majority of DCSD parents are, were, were raised in a time when schools actually promoted and taught leadership skills, not group think. Let me share with you a few reasons why we don't trust or believe what the CDC or Tri-County Health has to say. Number one, follow the money. The CDC is a federal agency partially funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Facebook, Kaiser Permanente, and the National Association of Chain Drug Stores Foundation, just to name a few. Number two, the drug companies have a long history of malpractice. A few examples include Johnson & Johnson, the manufacturer of atypical antipsychotics, Risperidone and Paliperidone, has pleaded guilty to criminal misdemeanor on their marketing of Risperidone. The company was fined $2.2 billion in criminal and civil fines in 2013 and $1.2 in 2012 for deceptive practices including hiding risks and exaggerating benefits. Another example. Who do you think is responsible for our current opioid epidemic? In the late 90s, pharmaceutical companies reassured the medical community that patients would not become addicted to prescription opioid pain relievers and healthcare providers began to prescribe them at greater rates. About 80% of people who use heroin first misuse prescription opioids. Another example, Pfizer Incorporated has agreed to pay $2.3 billion, the largest healthcare fraud settlement in the history of the Department of Justice, to resolve criminal and civil liability arising from the illegal promotion of certain pharmaceutical products. Dare I say, Tuskegee and Nuremberg trials? Now, all three manufacturers of this experimental drug have been granted immunity for any long-term consequences of the vaccine by our federal government. How long do we consider these people the experts when they have a long history of getting it wrong? Number three, a few nuggets of truth probably not widely known. The pharmaceutical companies pushing these vaccines eliminated their, eliminated their control groups. Were you aware of that? Proper testing requires a control group to know what impacts or side effects actually happen when taking the vaccine. Without control groups, these companies are incapable of identifying side effects directly connected for the, from the vaccine. Number four, I remind anyone listening to this, again, the vaccine isn't even approved by the FDA, but please remember we are their experiment and you would be pushing their agenda. This is why medical experts say they are practicing medicine, and you want us to give this to our kids so we can send them to school for equity or potentially soon to be CRT indoctrination? There's a video that's gone viral of a functional medicine doctor that's in your inbox present presenting to his local school board of the poor direction of the CDC and why supported by medical studies. My ask is that before you push a decision based on the CDC or Tri-County Health Department that you pursue information from other avenues. There's a reason people get second opinions in the medical industry. Thank you, Ms. Mason. I support Ms. no Mason, mask requirements your, your or vaccine requirements for students Ms. and Mason, staff now and in me. the future because the truth Mason, will eventually prevail. The time is However, up. we may not know the Ms. consequences Mason, until it's too late. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Susie Kuntz is next and Greg Gilbert and Ico Browning. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to thank you for your decision to, to make mask, mask optional for the students in Douglas County. Although I don't understand the decision to require masks for certain unvaccinated staff, this seems con contradictory and senseless. It makes no sense that hundreds of students of all ages can go unmasked, but a few unmasked adults could be dangerous. It seems like madness given that the virus is generally not dangerous to anybody unless they have compromised immune systems or other at-risk factors. The COVID panic and fear-mongering is continuing nationwide and will as long as we allow it to happen. I hope we can stop buying into it at a local level. I am concerned 
that a change in the masking mandate policy for D DCSD students is around the corner. As stated in communications from the district, we will continue to monitor cases. If policy is going to continue to be dictated based on cases, we're destined for a new mask mandate. Additionally, the CDC has already recommended masking for children and Tri-County Health seems to fall in line with the CDC. Thank goodness DCSD has not completely fallen in line with the guidance yet. The public has lost trust in most public health organizations and officials, most particularly the CDC. I'll leave it at that. If the district does consider reinstatement of mask mandates, I would ask that the board and or superintendent reference data and numbers in Colorado and Douglas County to support the decision. Please don't hide behind Tri-County Health or CDC recommendations and statements that cases, case counts are going up or that enough people aren't vaccinated. None of that should matter if hospitalizations and deaths are not rising materially. Please back the decision up with data and facts that matter. Some simple information that would, be help, that would help rationalize the decision would be deaths and hospitalizations compared to and as a percentage of total cases by age range and in comparison to the previous peaks. This information is readily available and very easy to compile. COVID has not been for the past year and continues not to be a substantial threat to healthy citizens, vaccinated or unvaccinated. The virus is with us forever can and cannot ever be fully eradicated. I hope you will continue to move toward policy that will stop instilling unnecessary fear into so many children and imposing the negative consequences that masks have on teens and children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coons. Greg Gilbert and Iko Browning and then Robin Susan. I believe Greg Gilbert is online. Mr. Gilbert, are you there? Okay, we will try to come back if he reconnects. Iko Browning, are you there? I believe you're remote as well. She is online. Iko, can you hear us? So Iko, one more attempt to have you unmute. Okay, well, we are looking to come back to Greg Gilbert and Iko Browning. Robin Susan, are you here? Good evening. Hi, everybody. My name is Robin Susan. I am the parent of three children that go to school in Parker. They are grades six, four, and two. Since this whole pandemic has begun, I have never once made my children conform to the mask wearing. I have made sure since they were born and came out of my womb that they were building their immune systems that God gave them. However, for my son, who is nine years old now, I did vaccinate him when he was younger, and at age 21 days old, he was injured and ended up with Bell's palsy. From then on, he has suffered from multiple mental and behavioral issues. My son, due to disability, cannot wear a mask. Regardless of me wanting him to wear one or not, it is something that makes him super anxious and he feels very uncomfortable doing. I would never again vaccinate him, especially with something used for emergency authorization. When school went remote in 2020, he struggled severely to concentrate. My children need God, I'm nervous, structure and education from professional teachers, not me. When school resumed in the fall of 2020, I transferred my kids from our current school to a charter school so that he would have not, not have to struggle with the mask situation. All three of my children never wore masks. All three of my children were also only quarantined one time all last year. During spring of this year, we pulled my son from school due to bullying. He is on medication, which makes him gain weight. So we pulled him, and during that time, his struggles became more evident, and we searched for care for him at Children's Hospital of Colorado, as well as Cedar Springs. We are looking for just a partial hospitalization program at the time. However, he was denied because they wanted him to wear a mask. If you haven't heard, Children's Hospital of Colorado has issued a state of emergency for their hospitals due to mental health issues not COVID. In 2020, reporting done by Douglas County Coroner's Office, one child under the age of 18 has passed away. 10 people in total under the age of 60. Why are we not listening to actual and factual information? Bottom line, this mass situation is not a one size fits all, nor is the vaccination. Every child is different. No one should be mandating or pushing children or anyone for that matter to wear a mask or vaccinate. If parents want to put their children in masks and vaccinate their children, I'm all for it. It's their child, it should be their choice. 
but it goes both ways. Not only are children affected by this, but what was sent out last Friday at the 11th hour for staff needing to wear masks if they were not vaccinated was disgusting. Talk about equity and inclusion. Are you kidding me? You can't pick and choose if you're gonna make teachers wear a mask and not get vaccinated or get vaccinated and you don't have to wear a mask. It's just ridiculous. I pray that this does not fall on deaf ears. Every child has the right to an education. Also, every parent has the right to do what's best for their child. It should not be the government's job nor yours to decide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Susan. I'm gonna go back and see if we picked up um, Greg Gilbert or Ico Browning, Mr. Blair. We do have Greg Gilbert back online. I'm sorry. What? Greg, can you hear us? The what? The person What's her name? Is she a public commenter? Yeah, she told me that she I see you. We're just, I'm sorry, your name is? Okay, and we will, you were one of the, we called earlier and. Very good. We'll circle back to you in just a moment. And um, going back to Mr. Blair, do we have either of those? Yeah, Greg is online. Mr. Gilbert, can you hear us? He's unmuted. Mr. Gilbert, one more time. And then do we have Ico Browning? Ico, can you hear us? Is that Mr. Gilbert or Ico? Okay, we'll, we'll still see if we can get that. Uh, Ms. Brown, since we did call you earlier, I will invite you to the podium. And then uh, next will be Jenny Riley, Elizabeth Armaza, and Chuck Bradley. Hey there. Good evening. How are you? Fine. Good. Thank you guys so much. Um, I watched, so I'm Latonya Brown, in case no one else knows. Um, I have two nephews that I am the guardian of um, in Parker. Um, however, last time I talked with everyone, um, I said I had two kids that were in uh, Douglas, Douglas County School, um, but now I only have one. Um, and it goes back to a lot of what I said in June, the constant harassment accusations, um, just kind of feeling like this, the high school that he was at wasn't equitable in a lot of ways. Tons of racial slurs, not only to him, but to other students, Asian students, et cetera. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about not CRT being um, the critical race theory that's, for, that's not taught in schools but I do um, support cultural responsive teaching, okay? And the reason why I say that, and I know one of the ladies who spoke earlier said something about the Tus Tuskegee um, experiment or clinical trial. So that Tuskegee study is what it actually was, and that's a part of history. If you don't teach history that includes everybody, right? So earlier in the summer, we heard tons of Black Lives Matter. And as an African-American woman, yes, Black Lives do matter. But tonight, I'm going to say all lives matter. And here's why. I want my kid to learn about African-American history in the United States. I want him to learn, I want all of them really, to learn about um, Latino or Hispanic histories here in the States and, and et cetera. Asian American Pacific Islander histories, that's important. Those contributions are important. Not being able to see yourself doesn't work. Doesn't work. I know what it's like when the school calls multiple times because of a suicidal kid. I had him, 37 seconds, I had him download, because I am a school social worker, I'm hey, download Safe to Tell, call the number, 
here, he had the, my kids have a therapist. So I would suggest, you know, going that route if that's up to you. Then to jump on to, sorry, um, SEL. So social emotional learning is something that I do with kiddos. Whether it's a kiddo that's a little kid that's throwing chairs across the room and de-escalating a kid, or helping them breathe, or helping them talk. A lot of times when, sorry, 50 okay. kids okay, Mrs. come to me, just yeah. give me one more Unfortunately, second. Unfortunately, I need to give everybody the same time. I'm I sorry. I know, but I drove Thank you. 40 I know minutes you did. over. If you have other comments, feel free to, to email the board if you have additional comments. Thank you. Next is... That's fine. Because it matters. Jenny, that's fine. Jenny Riley, you after. Uh, are you online? Jenny Riley is not online. Okay. And Mr. Blair, do we have our other two people yet? Or? They are still online. We can try them again. Okay. Mr. Gilbert or Ms. Browning? Either one online? Mr. Gilbert first. Mr. Gilbert? And okay, Ms. Browning, are you online? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, Ms. Browning. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, President Ray and Board of Directors. My name is Aiko Browning. I'm a practicing physician and a Highlands Ranch resident with two kids who attend Douglas County Schools. I would like to discuss some of the most recent recommendations per national organizations. Per the CDC webpage, and I quote, due to the circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, CDC recommends universal indoor masking by all students, all age two and older, staff, teachers, and visitors to K to 12 schools, regardless of vaccination status, and I end quote. My daughter is eight years old. She is not yet eligible for vaccination against COVID. None of the kids younger than age 12 are eligible for vaccination against COVID. They remain completely unprotected. The best risk reduction for these at-risk young children is universal masking, in addition to adults receiving their vaccinations. It's a small inconvenience to wear a mask to protect young lives. Please heed the recommendations of the CDC. Let's keep our kids safe so that they may continue in-person learning. In addition, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations can be found at aap.org. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends, and I quote, all eligible individuals should receive the COVID-19 vaccine. It may become necessary for schools to collect COVID-19 vaccine information of staff and students and for schools to require COVID-19 vaccination for in-person learning. Adequate and timely COVID-19 vaccination resources for the whole, com whole school, school community must be available and accessible. All students older than two years and all school staff should wear face masks at school unless medical or developmental conditions prohibit use. The AAP recommends universal masking in school at this time for the following reasons. One, a significant portion of the student population is not eligible for vaccination. Two, protection of unvaccinated students from COVID-19 and to reduce transmission. Also, there is a lack of a system to monitor vaccine status among students, teachers, and staff. There is potential difficulty in monitoring or enforcing mask policies for those who are not vaccinated. In the absence of schools being able to conduct this monitoring, universal massing is the best and most effective strategy to create consistent messages, expectations, enforcement, and compliance without the added burden of needing to monitor vaccination status. The possibility of low vaccination uptake within the surrounding school community and continued concerns for variants that are more easily spread among children, adolescents, and adults. An added benefit of universal masking is protection of students and staff against other respiratory illnesses that would take time away from school. And I end that quote. You can visit that on the American Academy of Pediatrics site at aap.org. Okay, Ms. Browning, thank, thank you. you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Jenny Riley, is she? Nope. Okay, Elizabeth Armaza, are you here? Okay, and then we have Chuck Bradley that's also indicates remote. 
Mr. Bradley, are you there? This is Chuck Bradley, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Bradley, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm a parent of an elementary age child here in the district. I would like to speak to you about two things tonight. First, as we go through these tough times, I would like to ask all sides to remain civil. Many of us witnessed the uncivil behavior at Mr. Wise's forum last week by the anti-mask, anti-science, anti-vax crowd. On top of that, this week, concerned DCSD parents were cyberbullied and harassed online by some of that same crowd. We have reported this to the authorities and to the DCSD board, and we ask that all sides counsel their members to remain civil. We don't need more Portlands and we don't need more January 6 incidents. But let me put that to the side. Here's my second thing. I'd like to talk to you about masks. I'm involved in a grassroots community of pro-science parents focused on DCSD COVID policies. Our main contention is that the district should be following CDC protocols, which we believe would include a universal masking mandate. I'll give you a chance to join our effort later, so grab a pen and paper. Our group recently started a petition for a DCSD mask mandate that gathered 1,200 plus signatures of concerned parents in just four days. All it took was four days to get 1,200 signatures. We have listened to the anti-mask, anti-science, anti-vax crowd for long enough. We are organizing to make our voices heard. And I could just, as a personal note, I'm so glad we have Dr. Douglas because I've heard about 50 COVID myths tonight. So uh, I'm glad we have him to dispel a lot of that stuff. Uh, if you ever wanna find out if something's really true, just do a search and add the word fact check onto the end of it and you'll find the real truth. Excuse me, audience. We know that superintendents um, in the in the in the uh, Tri County region are, um, are are trying to be involved with Tri County Health, and we appreciate that. But please don't don't pass the buck to Tri County Health. Uh, if you'd like to join our DCSD Pro Science effort to lobby the board, email us at dcsdproscience at gmail.com. No dashes, no spaces. That's DCSD proscience at gmail.com. Being pro-science, we have adapted our views and we too want in-person school and we want it to remain in-person. We feel like a universal mask mandate is the best way to prevent schools from being shut down this fall as well as keep everyone safer. We ask that you join that cause. I would also add that the Colorado Academy of Physicians today endorsed a universal mask mandate requirement for the state of Colorado. I thank you for your time and thank you to the board for your service. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Uh, next is Joelle Chambers. Is Joelle here? I believe Mr. Jones is reading for Joelle Chambers. Good evening, my name is Andy Jones and I'm proud to speak for Joelle tonight. She has one comment. Parents feel like Charlie Brown lined up to kick the football, and you are Lucy promising that this time you will really, really hold it steady. And I and so many others have no trust in this board when it comes to masking our kids. Hold fast, Corey, and don't be Lucy. This BOE has been hired to work for the 35,000 residents of Douglas County. Your job as a school board is to lead and direct the administration of this school district so that they can lead and direct the 5,000 employees whose jobs are to educate the 60,000, probably decreasing every moment we talk about these things, that's my own comment, sorry, that you are not their healthcare providers or the guardians of their health decisions. Your job is to provide an education. The parents and adult employees of Douglas County all have access and ability to make health choices for themselves and those, and they are the responsible ones for the response of their perception of this current pandemic. We have started the school year with the expenditures of no mask, no discrimination between vaccinated and the unvaccinated. I wanna to say to the parents and teachers of this district some words of hope. Help is on the way. No, it is not in the continuation of this current board leadership. We can lo no longer bathe in the warm water of mediocrity and divisive board initiatives that do not focus on putting kids first in their decision making. The kids first candidates are this district's only hope for a future of transparency, bond, and mill levy overrides. Becky Myers, Christy Williams, Kaylee Wanniger, and Mike Peterson are the only ones who will be able to regain the trust and confidence of this community. 
especially the more independent and conservative leaning voters, to support the building of new schools, addressing the pay disparities with teachers and bus drivers. If the liberal majority stays in power on this board, you will create another funding drought because these people and so many more do not trust you. Uh, she goes on to say, please go to voteforkidsfirst.com and find out more about uh, these amazing candidates who want to bring balance and healing back to the kids, parents, and staff of this amazing district. Thank you, Joyle Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Jones, on behalf of Joyle Chambers. Um, just going to loop back one more time. Uh, do we have Mr. Gilbert? Okay, I unmuted. Hey, Mr. Gilbert, finally. Good evening. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you so much. Let me get back to my comment section now. Okay. So thanks for... Uh, listening to me, my initial comments relate to no mask mandates and vaccine, no max vaccine mandates. We live in a time where our federal elected officials and heads of federal health agencies provide mostly confusing, biased information regarding COVID-19, wearing masks, and getting vaccinated. Oftentimes they state that they will follow the science, but they have destroyed their credibility by reportedly or repeatedly ignoring the science and prioritizing political political agendas at the expense of the American people. Because of their refusal to be totally transparent and truthful about these issues, it is difficult to really know the facts. Below is my interpretation of the science of COVID-19 as it impacts our K-12 through students. Number one, the risk of our kids dying from COVID-19 is extremely low and essentially rounds to zero. Accordingly, the science and facts would support that our children don't really need to be vaccinated. Number two, the risk of our kids dying from getting a COVID vaccination is also very low. The science suggests it would be safe to vaccinate our children. There is evidence around the world that some children in this age category are experiencing significant health issues from the vaccination with some dying. Some countries such as Israel and Germany have discontinued their mandatory vaccinations because of the alarmingly high instances of these adverse health issues. Number four, the Delta variants is more contagious, but the mortality rate is lower. Number five, credible studies and data conclude that more children in this age category die from the flu than from COVID-19. Six, our children are not super spreaders of COVID-19. Seven, wearing masks provides little or no benefit to prevent spreading or contracting COVID-19. Eight, studies have shown that forcing our children to wear masks causes physical, mental, and social issues. Mandating the wearing of masks is too high of a price to pay for a false sense of security. Number nine, states like Florida and some countries have been operating their schools with no mask mandates and no vaccination mandates without unusually high adverse health issues. In fact, Florida is doing better than most states and they are not impl implementing draconian policies. The science concludes that COVID-19 is not a grave threat to our school age children. However, there are cases where some children die from COVID-19 and others die from receiving the vaccination, but these are very small percentages of the total age group. It seems impossible to eliminate all risks associated with COVID-19. The board should not mandate vaccinations or the wearing of masks. The science does not support such a policy. Based on science, it is virtually impossible to eradicate COVID-19, so in some fashion, it is here to stay. We can't lock up forever. We can't live in fear forever. It's time to ignore the fear mongers. It is time to free our children from the fears of the disease and allow them to get on with their normal lives, including getting back to a normal school environment that existed prior to the pandemic. Credible data shows that more children... Okay, Mr. Gilbert, your time is up, Mr. Gilbert. Thank you so much for your comments. Mr. Blair, we're just going to give one more check with you to see if there's any of our online people that we missed that may be lingering. No, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. We will at this time then bring public comment to a close. Just again, want to thank all of the public commenters for your passionate thoughts, your, your convictions. Um, you do influence our thinking. We, we do walk away with new insights because of your comments. I would though just again extend an invitation that if you want to have conversation, please, I have had the pleasure of meeting with several
people that have come to public comment and meeting them in person and having conversation. And what I find is that it is much more productive oftentimes for us to have interaction than just stating our opinions. So again, I will tell you that these people up on this dais have never declined an opportunity for a phone conversation or an opportunity to meet face to face over coffee, um, whatever. Um, so I would encourage you, if you would like to take this to the next step, um, we would be delighted to be able to sit down with you face to face and answer questions, have conversation, and have interactions. Um, I would just, again, emphatically uh, state that this board does not, does not make decisions on mask mandates or vaccine mandates. This board holds our superintendent accountable to follow policy. And as one commenter mentioned tonight, there is a policy that specifically guides our superintendent in terms of how he makes decisions regarding uh, disease and communicable disease or transmission of communicable diseases. And, and that's what our superintendent follows, including the communication of, to staff. This board does not make those decisions. This board sets policy and guidelines. So I uh, would encourage you to, as the commenter tonight shared, to study policy EBBA, which is our primary policy that the superintendent indeed follows. I would also say I know there's, there's different opinions about our public health agencies, um, but the work that Mr. Wise does is in collaboration, not um, he's not being directed by our public health agencies. He's working together with them to make the best decisions possible for our students. I'm looking forward to having more conversation about our equity policy. As you saw, those of you that were here earlier in our meeting, we definitely have a, a plan for roundtable conversations to really, again, to interact and really have a common understanding of what that means. And so as you see the, the plan for uh, this year, hopefully you see some intentionality around putting us together face to face and having conversation. So again, I would just thank you, um, public commenters, um, for sharing and for spending the evening with us. Uh, Director Holtzman? Um, oops, sorry, I didn't get that on. Um, Director Ray, I, I think it would be appropriate. I know there's certain times in, during public comment, if we have someone who brings something that um, might be able to be addressed by our superintendent or most likely his designee at a school level, if he could follow up. And I know I glanced at him a couple of times and saw him taking notes, but I was just gonna make a request if he could possibly follow up with Mr. Nichols and Ms. Brown, since they mentioned specific schools and I thought that might be helpful, thanks. And, and Mr. Nichols is actually a former student of mine and we've had conversations, so I'd love to see him hook up with Judy Jordan, uh, the bridge program coordinator. So thank you, Director Holtzman for that. Okay, moving on. Um, next on our agenda is the consent agenda, which has one, two, three, four, five items, including a change order for construction at Pine Lane North, approval of an easement for a sidewalk at Mountain Vista High School, approval of an intergovernmental agreement between Douglas County and um, with the coordinated elections between Douglas County and also with Elbert County for the upcoming coordination and approval of personnel changes. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion made by Director Holtzman, seconded by Director Meek. Any further discussion? Seeing none, let's go ahead and vote. Director Graziano. Aye. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Holtzman. Aye. Director Lung. Aye. Director Meek. Aye. Director Ray, aye. That, that passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is the approval of the unofficial minutes from our previous meetings. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Motion made by Director Graziano, seconded by Director Holtzman. Let's go ahead and vote. Director Graziano. Aye. Director Hansen? Aye. Director Holtzman? Aye. Director Lung? Aye. Director Meek? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. That passes unanimously. Next on our agenda is to do some housekeeping items with regards to some revisions to policies. And board directors, as you know, uh, we spent a work session with our cabinet members to really begin looking at 
what we need to revise to make sure that we have opportunities to do study sessions with our cabinet as well as times like tonight when we actually do uh, formal types of action. And so in that conversation, we talked about the format of our meetings as being a way to alternate times that we do formal action versus times that we actually have study sessions so this board can be developed in terms of our understanding of all the topics that we heard tonight um, from academic excellence to outstanding staff and, and uh, educators to uh, financial well-being. So all those topics that are our end goals really become study sessions that we'd like to delve in more deeply. So with that, we need to be able to um, revise some of our current policies to make that clarification and also uh, to help our public also see what topics are upcoming. Um, so to provide more transparency for our public to know that these, this is a topic that the board's going to study and this is a topic that the staff's gonna monitor and bring to us to help us show what progress is being made. Um, this board does, um, for many, many years, uh, subscribe to a policy governance model, which really is a checks and balances kind of a model that says that we uh, make sure that we put policies in place, we make sure we're clear about the limitations for our superintendent, and that we operate at a different level than necessarily making every decision that is made in a system which would be um, humanly impossible for seven people on the dais. So with that, I want to introduce the revisions to policy BEDH, which is public participation at school board meetings. The revision in this policy simply just updates um, the, our concept of alternating business meetings with study sessions. And so I will first of all entertain questions or reactions to that policy. Again, it's, it's pretty much the same in terms of the rest of the policy and inviting board or inviting public comment to come to our, um, our board meetings and make public comment, but the only difference is that we're alternating similar to what other uh, boards do throughout the state. This is typical practice for, for other boards as well. So any questions regarding the revision to this policy? Any questions? All right, seeing none, then I will entertain a motion to accept the revision to board policy BEDH. I move to accept the revision to board policy BEDH. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, let's vote. Director Graziano? Aye. Director Hansen? Aye. Director Holtzman? Aye. Director Lung? Aye. Director Meek? Aye. And Director Ray? Aye. That passes unanimously. Then, this is an outcome of this policy, which then um, gives an overview of our meeting dates, our 21 22 meeting dates. And as you can see, in August, we do have two regular meetings, uh, regular business meetings, which is today, as well as our August 24th meeting. Then starting in September, we'll begin that rotation where the first meeting of the month is for our study sessions with our cabinet or other staff. And then our second meeting of the month would be more geared towards a, a business meeting along with staff presenting to us the monitoring report for that particular goal. And again, I think what this does is it gives our communities um, a, a, a snapshot of what the whole year will look like and when to anticipate certain topics being discussed. Any questions regarding the new meeting dates? And they're really not new, but they're just labeled such that it's more clear in terms of the purpose for those meetings. Any questions regarding that? Seeing no questions, then I will entertain a motion to accept the 21-22 schedule of meetings for this year. Motion to accept. Second. Motion made by Director Lung, seconded by Director Graziano. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and vote. Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. Passes unanimously. Next policy that needs some housekeeping is policy BEAA, which is the electronic participation in school board meetings. 
We, uh, as you may recall, due to the pandemic, we passed a resolution allowing for the board to do meetings remotely um, because of a public health order that restricted the use of this room as well as restricted us being able to do in-person meetings. So what this particular policy does is it simply makes it a policy now that a board director can participate remotely in a regular or special meeting. The previous practice was that that would only be for special meetings only. But given our past practice and given that we certainly anticipate that there may be a need for board directors to um, participate remotely, we felt uh, that putting that in policy now uh, makes sense. The other thing I would highlight regarding this policy is just um, a request for board directors to notify as soon as possible. It's, this policy recommends three business days prior to a meeting if you should see that you have a need to uh, participate remotely and that it also limits the number of times that you participate remotely to uh, only two occasions. And it, obviously it's for uh, extenuating circumstances um, that you would choose uh, to do that. Certainly if a public health order again were to be to come into play regarding in-person meetings and, and in terms of whether we could use this, um, this room, that would override this policy. But for now, this would be just a regular policy that would, uh, that would define our future practice that says that remote participation can be done both at regular or special meetings at least twice a year and with advance notice. Any questions regarding the revisions of that policy? Director Graziano? Yeah, um, this kind of refreshed my memory because I, I can remember originally the policy was we changed it from being remote where we didn't want to have remote, we, we wanted to have a in person. So what's the, why would we make it, I guess, you know, adjust back now to make it easier to be remote again? Yeah, at one time, um, and, and this is before your, your time, there was some abuse with um, board directors calling in or doing remote. Um, and, and so at that time, that board really wanted to restrict that ability because there was concern that that was being abused. And we really believe that we ought to do our business in person as much as possible. So we did change that a few years ago for that, for that reason. But I think given the current times and the pandemic that we've been through and that we've, we see that we have put restrictions in place so that it will not be abused, I think that's what this policy does um, in an upgraded fashion. Other questions regarding revisions to this policy? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to accept the revisions to board policy BEAA. I'll make a motion to accept the revisions to board policy BEAA. Second. Motion made by Director Holtzman, seconded by Director Hansen. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, let's vote. Director Graziano. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holtzman. Aye. Lung. Aye. Meek. Aye. Ray, aye. That passes unanimously. Next policy uh, for revision is policy JLCDB, which is a policy specific to administering medical marijuana, hemp oils, and or cannabinoid uh, products. Uh, Governor Pol Polis signed into law uh, Senate Bill 2156 some changes that obligate school, dis school districts um, in terms of how we handle administration of medical marijuana in school. That statute now requires that school districts are required to, uh, required by the law to enact policies with the new law. And those, that, that policy needs to show some revisions to our existing policy, including the requirements of the new law. And the new law basically discusses that there is now the availability for school personnel to volunteer to administer mer medical marijuana to students when previously that was only given to the primary caregiver to come onto our school site to do that. Um, this policy also protects anyone um, that chooses not to volunteer that they will not uh, um, be harassed or bullied or there would be no retaliation. So this policy does also 
provide that additional protection as well. So with that, we have a policy that has um, been significantly revised to align to state statute. And uh, General Counsel, Ms. Clemish, anything else you would like to add to my summary? Um, Director Ray, I think you did a fine job of summarizing the basis for this policy. The one thing I would add is that we tried in an effort to propose revisions to organize the existing policy to, define, to include some definitions and then to separate the circumstances or requirements related to the permissible administration of medical marijuana by the primary caregiver which was previously allowed under our policy and consistent with state law, as well as the permissible administration um, by a, an individual volunteer in the schools as designated by a primary caregiver. And that was done to assist in interpreting the policy easily and to adapt the circumstances. The law now requires that we allow volunteers to do it consistent with the law and this policy that the district adopted. And the law also does require, as you've indicated, that the board do, does pass a policy and that each school district in the state of Colorado have a policy in this regard. Additionally, I would just mention that there is a discussion in the statute with respect to the, as well as the policy, with respect to a preparation of an implementation plan in the event that a volunteer is administering medical marijuana pursuant to the directives of the healthcare provider and the care, or the parent caregiver for, of the child. And that will be initiated after adoption of this policy by the superintendent in accordance with the superintendent's authority to implement policy, and that would become a superintendent file policy. So it'll be a regulatory policy that accompanies this that will give our schools more direction from an operational perspective regarding this. Correct. Essentially, it would be a form that would guide the administration through the appropriate decision-making process along with the with the parent guardian in, in making those decisions. Very good. Board directors, any other questions regarding the, the um, construct of this policy for Ms. Clemish? All right, so board, we do have the option, since this is a policy that already is in place, um, we do have the option to approve this policy, the revisions to this policy upon this first reading. We can also, um, the other option is to allow a second reading of this policy if you think that, that is necessary. But because we do have a policy in place, this is considered a re revision to the existing policy. So I'll entertain a motion either way, either a motion to uh, simply acknowledge a first reading of this policy or a motion to extend uh, to a second reading at our next board meeting. I'm, and, I'm, and I said that wrong. The option really is to a motion to either approve this policy as revised tonight or a motion to um, recommend that this policy receive a second reading at our next board meeting. So with that, a motion, please. I'll move to approve as revised. Second. Motion uh, made by Dr. Director Graziano to approve as revised, seconded by Director Hansen. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and vote. Director Graziano. Aye. Director Hansen. Aye. Director Holtzman. Aye. Director Lung. Aye. Director Meek. Aye. And Director Ray is an aye. I did mean to just acknowledge our legal uh, counsel, of both um, Ms. Clemish as well as Wendy Jacobs, who have spent a great deal of time in really uh, helping navigate this. Um, and so I just want to express my gratitude to your department for helping us get a policy in place that really does uh, spell things out very clearly as well as um, protects our staff in terms of whether they choose to volunteer or not. So thank you. And thank you, Director Ray. All right, moving on then, our next set of policies really are what we call executive limitations. And as I mentioned earlier, because we are a policy governance board, executive limitations really are those things that this board says 
to our superintendent, these are the things that we want you to take notice of from, uh, from our perspective. These are the things that we wanna make sure that you operate within. Um, and, and it really provides our superintendent clarity in terms of what the board's desires are. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to make sure those parameters are clear for our superintendent to operate within. And so this is the first reading of these elected, uh, executive lip limitations. There are 16 of those. And so obviously I'm not going to read them to, to you tonight, but I will go through these each one just to highlight the topic. So we read that into public. So again, that our public hears that those are the things that we feel that our superintendent, those are the guardrails that our superintendent must operate within. So the first one, and then board directors, I will pause for a second or two to see if you have any other insights uh, regarding this. This again was some great work that we did uh, on a Saturday in July to really work with our cabinet as well as work together in terms of doing uh, some updates to this. And again, this is another example of these things exist in our policy governance right now, but um, it's been since 2007 that those executive limitations have been updated. So this board has been committed to really working through a lot of policy updates and a lot of things that needed to be updated from years ago. And so um, this is one more, this is an, another effort on our part to make things as clear as possible, as transparent as possible for our community to understand um, what this board values. So the first executive limitation, uh, and this, these are first readings, is the global executive constraint that simply just makes the statement, and this is really a statement that is uh, echoed throughout all our executive limitations regarding how the superintendent should um, act in terms of ensuring that practices, activities, decisions, or organizational circumstances are lawful, ethical, safe, respectful, prudent, commonly accepted business and professional ethics in accordance with board policy as further defined in the other policies that we're about to highlight. That's the only one I will read for word for word because that really sets the tone of the rest of these policies that we are putting into place or considering for first reading. Any, any, and I'm just gonna pause for a second or board directors if you'll wave at me if as I, as I move through these rather quickly. Uh, the next one is Executive Limitation 2, which talks about emergency superintendent succession, specifically that the superintendent identifies two individuals that can succeed him should he be absent or should there be some, un, uh, some extenuating circumstances that cause him not to perform his position. Executive limitation number three is development of administration policy. And this one simply highlights the need for the superintendent to put things in writing. That whenever he has a policy that impacts the system, those policies should be written as well as up for review by the board. Executive limitation number four, communication to the board, again, provides very specific kinds of things that the board needs to have information about and specifically encourages the superintendent to make sure the board is, is as informed as possible. Executive limitation five is commitment to accomplishment and accountability. This really mirrors some of the accountability statute as well as those expectations around school advisory or school accountability committees. Um, so it really just replicates that expectation that there will be accountability to the system regarding the goals that the board has set. EL6, Executive Limitation 6, is educational program. And again, just uh, captures the essence of making sure that we are indeed meeting Colorado academic standards and then some very specific things in terms of how that gets accomplished. Executive limitation number seven is instructional materials, selection and adoption. This also is very reflective of policy that's already in place. But again, it just highlights a value that this board has in terms of how materials are selected and adopted. Executive limitation eight, treatment of students, parents, parent guardians, and community members. Um, this again is in existence, but again, it just highlights the things that we heard tonight in terms of making sure that our community is engaged, uh, that they're treated well, uh, 
respectfully, uh, et cetera. Again, um, something that we've had in place, but that we are updating with some language that aligns with state statute. Executive limitation number nine, student conduct, discipline, and attendance. Again, this is policies that have been in place, but also reinforces the notion of some uh, expectations that we wanna make sure our superintendent has regarding conduct, discipline, and, at and attendance. Executive limitation number 10 is school safety. We have some great policies that we have worked on and updated to ensure that we have a comprehensive safety plan for our schools, and this just highlights that that is an expectation that that be implemented and in place. Executive limitation number 11 is staff treatment. And again, you see the same kind of language in there in terms of how to treat staff in a lawful, ethical, safe, respectful, non-disruptive, dignified way and in compliance with board policy. Executive limitation 12 is regarding staff compensation. And you will see that we've updated this to reflect the compensation expectation that the board, this board defined in a resolution. So this is now in our, an executive limitation uh, regarding things like predictable salary schedules as well as compensation that attracts and retains our top quality staff. Executive limitation 13 is staff evaluation. Uh, this again is aligned with not only our policy, but also state statute in terms of what a staff evaluation should look like and some expectations around that. Executive limitation 14 is regarding budgeting. So again, aligns with our board goal around um, fiscal responsibility, uh, financial well-being, but again, captures some of the most important things that we wanna make sure that budgeting represents when it's presented to us. Executive limitation 15, financial administration, is an overview of how we do business and making sure that our district's financial health um, is in good standing. And then finally, executive limitation 16, which is asset protection, which again um, captures the notion that we wanna make sure that the assets that we have in our district are well protected. So those are the 16 executive limitations. Uh, this is a first reading. These executive limitations will be further vetted by our legal counsel before our next meeting, as well as some other staff members in terms of if we need to tweak some of the wording again to make sure that it's aligned to board policy. We also anticipate that each of these executive limitations will have a cross-reference to all our board policies, so it's very easy to also um, look into our administration policies to see the connection. So with that, any questions or discussion regarding the first reading of our executive limitations? Because I presented them so well and so clearly, and so, all right. So at this time, we do not need to, this is an information only, this is simply for us to inform our public that these are the things that this board is valuing in terms of how we set the guardrails for our superintendents. So uh, at our next board meeting, there will be a proposal to accept these limitations and have them replaced, replace the existing limitations with these. Director Lung. So I see this draw as a lot of um, pending legal advice legal review or some of them just basically have a yellow and say that in certain percentage and things like that. So are we going to look at this one section at a time or are we going to the next meeting, we're going to evaluate all 16 of them and pass it all of them at the same time. And, and it, it, do we even have legal, enough time for legal to, uh, to look at some of those sections that say under legal review? So to answer your question, each one of these does have a specific need for us to pass a motion to adopt mm -hmm. it as a policy. So, so yes, we will do that. We have just some minor tweaks, Director Lung. They're not significant. They're just some minor inserts, like you said, as well as our legal counsel doing some vetting to ensure that the, li the language also aligns with legal parameters. Um, Mrs. Clemish, Director Lung's concerned about the timeline. Do you feel pretty confident that by the 24th, uh, the legal department will have a chance to do the vetting that we're asking you to do? Um, we will do our best as long as, of course, unanticipated and unexpected circumstances would prevent us from having the time to do it, but we don't anticipate a problem at this time. Very good. <coughs> Director Meek. 
So I'd like to thank Cabinet for all the work they did. I know you all have gone through these policies as well, the executive limitations and crosswalk those with potential monitoring reports. And so I just really wanna thank all of you for all of that work because I know it's been a significant amount of work, but I think the, um, the process is gonna be very helpful for our community to understand these in a little bit more readable format and the monitoring piece I think will be really, really helpful. So thank you. Director Lung. Um, I thought last time when we talked about that during the um, retreat, we, are we going to put some sort of um, reference to our current policy in here? Because right now it's still only see the CRS. It does not referencing what kind of A policy or B policy or C policy that this will map to. So Director Lung, you mm -hmm. must have missed my comment. That oh. I, I stated that on the 24th, we'll have cross references to all board policies, so. Um, you know, after two hours public comment, <laughs> I think I'll give you, um, just I'll give give you a little grace. bit more the grace on that. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some grace. But yes, indeed, that is, that's the intent, is by the 24th, we'll have a final copy with all the board references, board policy referenced. All right, anything, any other questions regarding uh, our first reading of our executive limitations? All right, moving on then to Board of Education reports. Uh, just some quick reminders for board. August 17th, we will be doing our committee launch here at the Wilcox Building at five o'clock and would encourage all of us, if possible, to be there, even if you're not a liaison, because I just think you'll hear some very important kind of overview information from um, Superintendent Wise, as well as some expectations around how our committees work um, to help us do our job. So that's again, August 17th at five o'clock. Agenda planning is this Friday at 10 o'clock. And then our next board meeting, which I stated earlier is a regular business meeting, is on the 24th, and then we'll start our rotation with study sessions in September. That's all I have to report. Questions, Director Graziano? Not a question, just, just comment that the MBOC meets tomorrow, tomorrow at six o'clock. Very good. So I know some of you are actually have met or meeting earlier than the launch with your committees. Uh, to, and, and really the, the objective is that by the next board meeting, we will have the priorities that those committees should focus on for the school year. So um, I know LRPC also met earlier as well. Um, and then that's, that's the only two committees I know of right now that have an advanced meeting be before our August 17th meeting. Other questions about upcoming events? All right, Director Holtzman. And I really do not have a vice president update, just grateful for the first day of school yesterday. That was really a great day. I know that all of us enjoyed it that got to participate, so thank you. Very good, would, would concur. Any other director items? Uh, director Meek? Yeah, since I didn't have a chance to say this earlier when we had item nine, parent, family, and staff engagement sessions, I can't tell you how excited and happy I am to listen to that presentation and hear a very proactive community engagement plan that has been set forward. Um, public schools thrive when there's strong, proactive, and coordinated engagement with our public. And that's students, it's parents, it's families, it's the entire community. And that is exactly what you were presenting earlier. And it is so helpful and refreshing to get that presentation. And it killed me not to be able to say that earlier, but I know we were short on time and trying to get to public comment. Um, just a couple of comments about it. Um, the, I heard the use of round tables when talking about the educational equity and inclusive excellence. Um, I'm kind of hoping it's round tables for all of it, you know, as opposed to a big audience and you're just talking to people. So just throwing out my own thoughts, I think the more our community can talk in small round tables and then provide feedback, that's much more engaging and we learn a lot more as well. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that that will be the format as well. And then I know we also heard about a dyslexia, you know, workshop and I'm, I'm kind of curious if that's aligned with the core curriculum for elementary and how that all kind of fits together. It feels like it's all aligned in some way. And I know we're gonna hear more in the future, but I just, 
I just kind of needed to share a couple of those thoughts and thank all of you for that presentation. Those are good thoughts, Director Meek, and I, I know we all concur. We're looking forward to that as well and, and appreciate our cabinet, all the work they've done to really be intentional about how we engage our community. Any other director items or director comments tonight? Seeing none, we will, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made by Director Holtzman, seconded by Director Graziano. All those in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. <laughs>